Those who possess intelligence in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of night and day. There are signs for those who possess intelligence. Do you remember God while standing, sitting, and under signs? And they reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord, you did not create all this in vain. Be you glorified, save us from the retribution of hell. Our Lord, whomever you commit to hell are the ones you have forsaken. Such transgressors have no helper. Our Lord, we have heard a caller calling to faith and proclaiming, You shall believe in your Lord. And we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us our forgive our uh, forgive us our transgressions. Remit our sins and let us die as righteous believers. Our Lord, shower us with the blessings you promised us through your messengers, and do not forsake us on the day of resurrection. You never break a promise. God responds. Your Lord responded to them. I never fail to reward any worker among you for any work you do. Be you female or female. You are equal to one another. Thus, those who immigrate and get evicted from their homes and are persecuted because of me and find and get killed, I will surely remit their sins and admit them into gardens with flowing streams. Such is the reward from God. God possesses the ultimate reward. Do not be impressed by the apparent success of disbelievers. They only enjoy temporarily and end up in hell. What a miserable destiny. As for those who observe their Lord, they have deserved gardens with flowing streams. They abide therein forever. Such is the boat given to them by God. What God possesses is far better for the righteous. Anyone want to make any comment? And can you read the word note? Yes. 3191. Your God is whoever or whatever occupies your mind most of the time. The true believers are those who remember God most of the time. See... 23, 84 through 89, and Appendix, Appendix 27. Yes. Peace be upon everyone. Welcome to back to the submission server. Welcome to the Quran study. We just read the verses from chapter 3, verse 190, until chapter 3, verse 198. Um, so if you have any questions or comments about the verses we read, now is the time you can provide them um, and share your input. You can type your question in VC1 dash chat or you can come up and you ask your question. Does anyone have any specific uh, question to ask? Any questions or comments about the verses that were just read? Um, I just wanted to say uh, one thing about uh, 3195 is that God's promise never fails, right? Um, and we, we see this again and again in many occasions, right? We're, uh, we're told by God, you know, um, that, you know, believe in him, put your faith in him, you'll be the winners, right? And a lot of times we, we, we get shaken up, we get scared that, no, what if, what if this doesn't happen, right? But we have to remember, you know, God says, whose, whose word are more true than me, right? And he will never fail you. He would never fail the believers. He would never uh, commit any injustice toward any of you, right? And I think that's very important, that our God would never lie, would never break his promise, okay? Um, and this is not something that, um, that you know, I mean, imagine if we, you know, God forbid, we had... We were in another creation, in another realm. We had another God, right? He might have uh, not been uh, truthful, right? He might have lied. But our God, okay, the God, the only God that we have ha is always true. He never breaks his promise. And because of that, we can be sure that whatever he told us in the Quran to do, if we do them, we will be uh, God willing guided and go to his heaven, God willing. If I could uh, add a comment 
Um, it's interesting, you know, it says, uh, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, the alternation of night and day, there are signs for those who possess intelligence. You know, when we think about the, uh, the alteration, we think of, I put a GIF in the VC1 chat. You see, okay, these planets are orbiting around uh, the sun. But realistically, uh, the, the sun itself is also uh, um, hurling through space. And we are chasing this fireball that has its orbit around the, uh, the, the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, this whole thing is in perfect synchronicity. That if the slightest uh, which one, pool was out of uh, control, that all, of, uh, all these planets, all the human beings on this planet, it's like it would all uh, 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 just be an utter annihilation. And we never stop to think about the, the, the beauty, the sophistication of this precise uh, balance that God has orchestrated. But if any of this, again, was the, the slightest bit off, um, you know, we wouldn't be here right now having this conversation. There would be no earth. There would be no uh, uh, civilization. And, you know, praise God, we never think about it. I mean, you think about it, you're on a plane, okay, you're hurling at, say, you know, 500, 700 miles an hour. And uh, you're 30,000 uh, feet above the air, and you have some turbulence. And, you know, everyone at that moment, their heart skips a beat, they get nervous, they're upset. But no one contemplates the speed by which we're flying through space. If, okay, so we are, the, the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. The, uh, so let's think, so the, the Earth spin around the sun. And then... Around the sun, we're going, let me see, speed. 67,000 miles per hour. So the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, and it's spinning around 67,000 miles an hour. And then on top of that... The sun is moving at 448,000 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, we, we never think about this. We never contemplate, like, okay, you know, just how uh, awesome this creation of God is. You know, you never experience turbulence. You never <laughs> are concerned that, you know, the, the, the pilot is going to crash. Um, and each day we wake up, we feel uh, uh, safe and comfort. Um, and we, we never uh, stop and ponder about this stuff. I wanted to add... Um about the apparent success. I mean, that's pretty loaded right there. Don't be concerned about their uh, apparent success. So that means that success doesn't you. Down at each other and with, oh man, that guy's got it together. And uh, we don't know the full story or the, the big enough. You don't know the conditions they were put in and, and how well they're persevering through their condition. You, you just don't know. And uh, so it's, it's good. You know, we should never um, so feel, even ourselves, you know, we, we have to not think of ourselves as better than other context of the Okay, Brother Jeff, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Um, let's move along. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about the verses that we've read? We noticed there's a lot of new people. For everyone listening, um, you can type and follow along the discussion in VC1 dash chat, or you can speak directly uh, and come up. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the verses that were read? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's an interesting statement here. It says, uh, I never fail to reward any worker among you for any work you do, be you male or female. You are equal to one another. Thus, those who emigrate and get evicted from their homes and are persecuted because of me and fight and get killed, I will surely remit their sins and admit them into gardens with flowing streams. Look at how much they sacrificed. <laughs> it's literally their lives. It, this is this is basically like to get something, you need to sacrifice something. This is a basic law in life. Um, and even 
non-sub mirrors that I know, they know this. Look, they, they say, I noticed this. Sometimes, you know, I got to sacrifice my working out to study or I got to sacrifice this to do that. And it's just a, it's just a matter of, of fact in life. And this is the same in religion. Sometimes you have to sacrifice certain things and God rewards it, of course, in this life and hereafter. But it is a fact that you need to sacrifice sometimes. So these people are sacrificing their lives. You can also sacrifice your money, right? That's also a form of sacrifice. You can sacrifice your time uh, to help submitters, be with submitters. Uh, you can sacrifice, you know, it can be small, it can be large. But basically here we have a big example. They're sacrificing their lives um, just, you know, to live their religion freely, uh, to gain the afterlife. I was going to comment on 3191 in the context of, you know, God is whatever occupies our mind most of the time. We are standing, sitting on our sides, and we do not, we are not oblivious to the world around us. We must be appreciative and cognizant. We have to be uh, aware. Sense of awareness is very important, and we tell ourselves, and we say to God, we know you did not create all this in vain. Everything was created for a specific purpose. And in regard to what we witness, we have to be appreciative. This is regarding the food we eat. This is regarding things that we experience, the pleasures of this world. We must be aware at all times and constantly remember God. Does somebody want to say something? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Brother Richter, your mic is unmuted. If you want to speak, you can speak. Otherwise, can you please mute yourself? You know, going on with the, the, the thing you said, actually, Navid, uh, the same ballpark, we see in uh, chapter 94, verses 5 to 8, we see, with pain there is gain, indeed, with pain there is gain. Whenever possible, you shall strive, seeking only your Lord. It's actually interesting, we almost said the same thing, because I was focusing more on the, with pain there is gain, and you were focusing more on the commemoration of God, which is essentially the same, the same aspect in these verses. Because if you look here, it says, with pain there is gain. Whenever possible, you shall strive, seeking all your Lord. So you may need to commemorate God constantly, whenever possible. One had said that. Any more questions or comments about the verse that we read? We read for all the new people that joined, we read chapter 3, verse 190 to 198. Okay, if there's no further questions, I want to load the next set of verses. Actually, we're, uh, I, I guess I didn't realize we're at the end of the chapter. There's only two verses sure. left. Yeah, I actually want to make a quick comment uh, regarding um, uh, 195, just really quick. Sure. Okay, so it says, uh, be you male or female, you're equal to one another. That, um. You know, right now there's all this uh, contentious uh, understanding that um, they say, uh, oh, no, you know, the, the men and women are equal in every regard, right? that there is no distinction between what a man is and what a woman is. Uh, it's just a uh, connotation. It's a social construct. And one of the things that, you know, God tells us is do not covet the qualities that God has bestowed upon uh, each, you know, uh, man and woman. The men enjoy certain quantity, uh, qualities and the uh, women enjoy certain qualities. Despite the fact that we can equally reach uh, levels of righteousness, uh, irrespective if someone's a man or a woman, it doesn't mean that in essence that uh, on every single footing, there's going to be, you know, uh, uh, equality uh, across the board. And this is part of God's beautiful design, is that each of us are given different gifts, different abilities, and God gave us exactly what we needed. And, you know, an example of this is you look at Moses. When God told Moses, hey, you have to go to, uh, to Pharaoh, he questioned his abilities. Uh, my tongue gets tied, I lose my temper, and he gave this, this list. But God knew that he was capable of doing what was required because God created him under his watchful eye. It's the same thing. It's like sometimes people, they get upset. They're like, oh, why you know, do the, the men get to do this or the women get to do that? 
the aspect is like, look, this is part of God's design, and we we accept uh, that God knows best. Okay, I'm loading the last two verses, inshallah. It's regarding righteous Jews and Christians. Loading it up in VC1 dash chat. And if you can use VC1 dash chat instead of VC1 chat, I think that would be better. Um, this is where we streamline the process and every, everyone's on here. Uh, righteous Jews and Christians, 3199. Surely some followers of the previous scripture do believe in God and in what was revealed to you and what was revealed to them. They reverence God, and they never trade away God's revelations for a cheap price. These will receive, uh, these will receive their recompense from their Lord. God is the most efficient in reckoning. All you who believe, you shall be steadfast, you shall persevere, you shall be united. You shall observe God that you may succeed. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much. Welcome to submission server. If you could just join in VC1 dash chat, peace be upon you all. And we're typing in VC1 dash chat. And if you have any questions or comments, we just read from chapter 3, verse 181. I'm sorry, is it 190? 3 190 until the end of the chapter. 3 200. Um, let's see. Uh, one thing, sorry, real quickly. I just had a quick comment on verse 200. There's several commands. There's four commands in this verse. It's very powerful. It's a short verse, but it's packed with commands. And it's the last verse of the chapter. It says, all you believe. So number one, you shall be steadfast. That's a command. You shall persevere. That's a command. You shall be united. That's a command. You shall observe God. That's a command. And it gives all these four commands. And then it says that you may succeed. I think it's a very powerful. And I think united is very, very important for believers to be united. Because it's unbelievable how much believers can strive, grow, develop, learn, and strengthen their belief when they are united. It's amazing. And it's so powerful. And I just want to refer to one verse. Um, chapter 18, verse 28. Um, regarding Quranic study groups, uh, Quranic study groups, it's 1828. It says, you shall force yourself to be with those who worship their Lord day and night and seek him alone. Do not turn away. Do not turn your eyes away from them, seeking the vanities of this world, nor shall you obey one whose heart we rendered oblivious to our message. One who pursues his own desires, whose priorities are confused. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding this matter. So you shall be united. Um, remember how Moses came down from the, the mountain and he, and he was angry at Aaron. And Aaron said, I was afraid that you would be angry with me that I divided the children of Israel. So they also knew about the importance of un being uh, united. So what about like... Uh, did Aaron make a mistake or did Moses make a mistake by getting angry at Aaron? I still couldn't figure that out. What do you guys think? I can give a answer. You know, my understanding is that there's a balancing act, right? Um, and this is a lot of times in the uh, our moral decision making. Uh, it's not going to be as black and white, right? Where in essence, we have to utilize discretion. And in this case, there's two uh, opposing kind of uh, um, uh, poles. One is saying that, hey, God is saying, if you divide yourself into sex, you'll be committing idol worship. The other uh, um, uh, side is that if you uh, compromise, you're also going to be committing I idol worship. So my take is from this lesson, we see the level of care that uh, Aaron put not to just be dismissive of, uh, dismissive of people. Despite the fact of the blatant idol worship that his people were committing, he still was concerned about that uh, breaking that other commandment. 
I think this is one of the uh, the mistakes that you know uh, is made is that we're quick to dismiss individuals for the slightest uh, 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 deviations from say the the way we view stuff. But um, uh, at the same time, it shows that you know if we're going to err, we should err on the side of being cautious, not to be dismissive. Then also, you know, we should not tolerate. Uh, blatant idol worship in the sake of saying like, okay, I'm going to put up with this because I don't want to be uh, uh, creating a, a, you know, sectarianism. So we need to be, uh, so Aaron did the right thing, if you look at this perspective. So we need to be united, but not compromise, is your answer? Yeah, but I think at the same time, it shows that, you know, under this, these kind of uh, uh, scenarios, the proper thing to do is what Moses did, but it, again, it shows the level of care that Aaron was uh, 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 putting not to uh, transgress on that other extreme. I see, that makes sense, yeah. Moses' actions, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Any questions or comments about the verses that were read? Um, you can come up and speak. Anyone would like to speak, please unmute yourself and come and ask your question. Otherwise, you can type also in bc one chat And I'm not sure in this situation, we're at the end of Chapter 3. I'm not sure if we don't have any questions. Do we just move to Chapter 4, I guess? Yeah, I think we can go forward if no one has any questions. Uh, yeah, we can go. Uh, how about four, one through six? Yeah, wonderful. Let's do that. Let me load it up here. Chapter four, verse one through six. I'm loading the verses in PC one dash chat. Just got that here. Um, and also, if someone can load the two footnotes. Here for chapter for verse one and verse three. Do we have a volunteer to read? I'll do it if no one wants to. Okay. okay I got it. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Surah for women, Al Nisa. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. O people, observe your Lord. The one who created you from one being, and created from its its mate, then spread from the two many men and women. You shall regard God, by whom you swear, and regard the parents. God is watching over you. Regard the orphans. You shall hand over to the orphans their rightful properties. Do not substitute the bad for the good, and do not consume their properties by combining them with yours. This would be a gross injustice. Grounds for polygamy. If you deem it best for the orphans, you may marry their you may marry their mothers, you may marry two, three, or four. If you fear lest you become unfair, then you shall be content with only one, or with what you already have. Additionally, you are thus more likely to avoid financial hardship. You shall give the woman their due dowries equitably. If they willingly forfeit anything, then you may accept it. It is truth it is rightfully yours. Do not give immature orphans their properties that God has entrusted with you as guardians. You shall provide for them therefrom and clothe them and treat them kindly. You shall test the orphans when they reach puberty. As soon as you find them mature enough, Give their, their properties, do not consume it extravagantly, in a hurry, before they grow up. The rich guardian shall not charge any wage, but the poor guardian may charge equitably. When you give them their properties, you shall, ha you shall have witnesses. God suffices as a reckoner. So in four, four one we have a footnote. This is the second longest surah, and the title indicates that it aims at defending the woman's rights. Any interpretation must be must favor the woman's rights, not the other way around. For for three, see appendix thirty for an, a detailed discussion of polygamy. Anyone have any questions regarding these verses?
I'll make a comment. Um, in verse 1, it says, O people, observe your Lord who created you from one being and created from it its mate and spread from the two many uh, men and women. The system that God utilized here on earth is that God is still the creator. The mechanism by which he creates is he created the concept of procreation. Where a man and a woman, in essence, get together and they have a, a child without the direct involvement of God. And this is uh, necessary because if God had to physically manifest himself each time to create a uh, child or any organism at that, in essence, there is no opportunity to disbelieve. The purpose of this world is to decide without God's physical presence, without us being able to physically see God, do we still uh, uh, accept and submit wholeheartedly to God alone. And this is one of the mechanisms that God has utilized. And we see this in other realms. Like, it's funny that, you know, there's people, they say, oh, you know, uh, this is uh, as if this is like a attributing partners with God. It's like, no, God is the creator, but the mechanism by which he creates in this world, it utilizes humans, it utilizes biology, it utilizes angels, other entities to carry out this, uh, this function. So if you look at these verses, we don't see polygamy being prohibited, but we do see a certain uh, limit to it, like a some certain restriction. If we look at Appendix 30, which the footnote refers to, it has a certain statement in there. It says, the Quran emphasizes the limitations against polygamy in very strong words. If you fear, lest you may be not be perfectly equitable in treating more than one wife, then you shall be content with one. Verse 4, 3. And the other one says, you cannot be equitable in a polygamous relationship, no matter how hard you try. 429. So this is, uh, but this is very strange. It's, in one place it says, uh, if, you, if you're not perfectly equitable, then be content with one. Another place says you cannot be perfect, like you cannot be equitable, no matter how hard you try. And yet, it's it's regarded as a limitation, not a prohibition. Just something interesting. What's interesting too is a a number of translations. So the, the, the way that the verse is written, it uses the term uh, uh, nisa, um, when it says you may marry, and Rishad translates their mothers, it says it, you may marry the women. Um, and they interpret that to mean the, uh, the orphans. But, um, as far as I know, nowhere in the Quran does it ever reference the, the, the orphan uh, uh, girls as a, purely as a, a, a nisa. Um, and this is just, they, they think that, in essence, this is a free reign to, to, to marry the, uh, the orphans. But irony is the, the orphans, orphans need guardianship. Uh, they need a, a, a bread earner, not a husband. But uh, this is like one of the ways they, they twist it. And Erdem, to your quote, yeah, it's like, I agree. I think this is one of the mechanisms that God is putting a uh, kind of a, um, uh, uh, a stop to this practice. This is one of the, uh, the the later revelations of the Quran, and you know, in today's day and age, it's almost impossible to justify polygamy. Uh, there isn't a, a sound Quranic justification today for someone to have more than one wife. Um, you know, if anything, it's an abuse of the uh, the rare instances when this is uh, permissible. This actually opens up another question, because. Uh... If we look at verse 4-3, uh, it says, If you deem it best for the orphans, you may marry their mothers. So, uh, is this the only criterion for for polygamy? Is th does, does the woman have to have orphans? Because I always read it that way, but someone said that <clears throat> it's only an example. What do you guys think? I agree. I mean, in the uh, before this uh, revelation, this is uh, an example. Um, it's not saying that it's uh, exclusive, but um, it's uh, it, it shows one of the mechanisms for which 
and would want to uh, uh, partake in a, a polygamy and for their uh, time and place. But this isn't something that uh, today uh, I could see uh, any kind of a form of uh, justification for. Um, it's similar to, say, for instance, like uh, fighting in war. Like, there's times and place for this. But if we're going to be applying it during a time of peace, <laughs> then in essence, we're abusing the, uh, the, 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 the verse. I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to add the, uh, the little bit of wisdom that Dr. Khalifa gave us. It, it, it's that you do it to relieve suffering. That would be the understanding is that it, you're, I, I was thinking, consider there be a, like a, a, a plague or something in a small community in the Amazon or something like that. And you're living there. <laughs> and the, the people, you're kind of an isolated community and the bread earners, they die. And and here you have women with their children and they need to be cared for and you love them. They're in your community, you know, and uh, so you ha consult with your wife and and you bring them on. And, and what if the one of the people is like in her childbearing years and she's never had a child before? And, you know, th these kinds of circumstances where it's extreme suffering that's happening and you're simply trying to to uh, leave it. See, so if I if I understand correctly, you're saying that if it alleviates suffering, that is the basic principle. There doesn't have to be orphans, right? Well, inevitably, I mean, it seems like it. It seems like that is a condition. Uh, that's a good point. Would you just say it's just that? Uh, I didn't hear Dr. Khalifa say that. I heard him say alleviate, just alleviate suffering in general. But it seems that, like, I don't know, the, the examples I bring up, there is the example, uh, you know, the, the, a younger woman who hasn't had a child yet, maybe, you know, she can be patient and wait. But the, the, but the mother who has children, she, she needs help right now. And uh, so maybe it is. Maybe maybe you're on to something there. Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example. So after a World War II, the number of men to women, so this is in 1950, in uh, Soviet Russia was 79 uh, uh, men for every 100 women. In uh, Germany was 86, in Austria was 87, and Poland was 91. And this becomes incredibly uh, problematic because now, in essence, you don't have enough uh, uh, parity between the men and the women. And, uh, you know, under these circumstances, like, OK, you, you have to pick what's the the uh, the, the best of a, a bad option. And, you know, it's funny, we were just talking about the, the distinction between uh, the uh, Moses and Aaron in regards to the situation. I see polygamy in the same uh, light. Is that okay? You're dealing with a bad set of hands, and you have to, in essence, try to do the best for it. Um, and you're not doing this because uh, you're just like, oh, you know, want to uh, uh, take on a, a, an additional wife or abuse, you know, God's commandments. Uh, similarly, God says, for instance, like uh, fighting during the sacred months is prohibited. If it's imposed upon you, right? Uh, uh, there's worse things than uh, uh, fighting. And I see it in the, the same light for this. Uh, on a side note, it's what's crazy is in uh, China with their uh, one-child policy, we consider women as a uh, liability because, in essence, when they would get married, the women would go to the uh, the, the husband's family, take care of the uh, husband's uh, parents, and that was their um, uh, that's kind of their retirement plan. Um, so there's mass genocide that was taking place uh, towards uh, baby girls. To the point that they had to outlaw uh, ultrasounds, but nevertheless, people would either have the delivery, find out it's a, a girl, and you know, uh, commit infanticide, or if they did get access, they would just uh, abort before a delivery. And now you have slews of the population that, in essence, the uh, ratios are so skewed that you have 140 men for each hundred women. To the point that they have to go and literally source wives from these developing countries. And uh, it, this is a form of, you know, mass, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, human trafficking uh, that's taking place. That, you know, uh, these are uh, 
uh, safeguards in essence to uh, protect uh, people, not to uh, to um, uh, yeah abuse and cause uh, destruction. I think Brother Shervin had a question uh, regarding 665 um, in relation to this. I'm not sure. Do you want to ask your question, Shervin? What's your question exactly regarding? Uh... Okay, Richter, did you have a question? You are unmuted and you have sounds. If you can mute yourself, I'll appreciate it. By the way, congratulations, everybody. Looks like we have a new record for a Quran study. This is wonderful news. Um, this is really wonderful. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself and come up. Otherwise, you could type your question in VC1-chat. Uh, Shervin, do you want to ask your question? Right. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. His question is, uh, if you can marry virgins. Yes, of course you can marry virgins. Why not? No, he's saying many virgins. That's what he's saying. Oh, many. Oh, I see. I see. Well, the context of polygamy has brought, I want to read this from uh, Erdem. He posted it from uh, uh, the appendix on polygamy from the Messenger of the Covenant. So it's for all practical purposes, Muhammad had one wife from the age of 25 to 50. During the remaining 13 years of his life, he married the aged widows of his friends who left many children. The children needed a complete home with a fatherly figure, and the provi prophet provided that. Providing a fatherly figure for orphans is the only specific circumstance in support of polygamy mentioned in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 3, which we just read. Other than marrying the widowed mothers of orphans, there were three political marriages during the, uh, in the Prophet's life. His close friends, Abu Bakr and Omar, insisted that he married their daughters, Aisha and Hafsa, to establish traditional family ties among them. The third marriage was to Maria the Egyptian. She was given to him as a political gesture of friendship from the ruler of Egypt. So that's kind of the, the point here. The question is, we have, yes, he, he provided the fatherly figure for the orphans, uh, but he also had political marriages. So how do we interpret the statement that providing a father figure for the orphans is the only specific circumstance support of polygamy mentioned in the Quran? So maybe it's only the, the only one mentioned to alleviate suffering but then, because he also had political... I don't know, so this is something I struggle with. What do you guys think? I think this uh, kind of goes towards some of these other uh, principles in the Quran. That, um, take, for instance, slavery. Uh, that until... The revelations of the Quran was fully there, right? It's basically put into a effect where it's going to be phased out. I see polygamy in the same way. This is a, a, a practice that's already been established, and you have the circumstances by which it can be justified. That in essence, it's uh, 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 permissible during this time, but again, uh, after the uh, revelation of the Quran, it's something that's going to be phased out. Um, that's a way uh, I currently understand it. Um, there are, you know, these, uh, uh, it was an established practice. Uh, it was something that was uh, uh, justified at that time. But um, again, uh, it's something that is uh, uh, phased out once we apply the, uh, all the verses of the Quran. Any questions or comments about the verse of the, that were read? We read the last 10 verses of chapter 3, and I believe uh, the first six verses of Can chapter 4. 
Go ahead, yeah. sister. Please come up. Uh, Salam, everyone. Um, thank you for the study. It's beautiful when you guys talk about Quran the whole time and ponder on the verses. I really appreciate that. Uh, and this is an area that I always have some issue with. Uh, brother said that uh, some of the things that are phasing out, like slavery, it may not be uh, like old way of slavery, but there are still slaves, uh, women who are being uh, controlled by men, and they cannot be free. They basically trap, and you know all the people with the uh, you know uh, sex trafficking that they direct them to certain area and the women from other countries no languages and i see people with uh, they, they come here to do the massage and they really live with um, standards and not no freedom basically they have to massage the whole time very minimum pay they have uh, they live together and um i mean uh, slavery is when you lose your freedom and there are still a lot of women under that condition, and they don't have a voice, and um, and you know not enough people to you know support them to get them out. So I think in in old ways of putting chain around their feet and their hands and <clears throat> and use them, I think there are still people are their kids are used uh, in Iran uh, to earn money and give the money to somebody else. And, um, and they're using women, they're using, I mean, everything still, I think, exists. One was every, every generation, every, you know, pretty, you know, present. So, but the, the form is changing, you know. Um, so I think, I wouldn't say it's phasing out. We still can free women from slavery if we have the eyes to look for them. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. If I could, uh, Thank you so much, you. sister. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, if, if under that context, you think about the uh, how many individuals from third world countries are being imported, and these are uh, predominantly uh, men as well, uh, to go with the promise of being able to earn an income. And in essence, what happens when they show up there? They have their uh, passports uh, confiscated. Uh, they are basically told that oh you want the for food and rent uh, that you're going to pay we're going to take it directly out of your uh, paycheck then they take more than what they uh, earn so they're in essence being utilized as slaves and they're in places where they don't have the uh, ability to get out so if you look at the the majority of the development that's happening in the middle east this is happening ironically through slave labor where they um lied to these people they told them that in essence oh they're going to be able to provide for their families and when they do they actually get them in debt and uh, these countries they have a, a debtor's prison if you don't pay your debts then in essence you go to prison so now they have no way out and we look at all these uh, uh high rises and these developments that they made and you know we can say definitively that this was predominantly made through the use of slave labor so it's like yeah it's it's not in the same as it was in the past uh, these are these practices are still in play, but the difference is when we're we're dealing with slavery, we're dealing with something that there's a legal system around, right? So meaning you can pay to to have someone free, you can pay to uh, in essence give them uh, their uh, rights back. These forms are happening on illicit markets. There isn't a legal uh, stipulation that you can go to to in essence uh, gain these people's freedom. These are individuals who, in essence, are uh, falsely uh, uh, imprisoning and uh, um, uh, trafficking them. It's just it's a different beast. You know, it's not like we can go to some website, and say, oh, OK, I want to, uh, you know, free these people from their uh, bondage. Uh, you know, these people are being uh, treated as uh, 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 prisoners, in essence, in an illicit market. I know uh, through a guy of a guy who has a slave who had a slave in Texas kept this girl intimidation and fear. Um, it happens everywhere. Intimidation, fear. Us men, we don't even know the degree to which we. 
replay a part in intimidation and fear in our own lives. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe my wife feels trapped. Maybe she feels intimidated or fear just because of my behavior. I think since we're we're reading sort of uh, from uh, from women, I think we should be contemplating on ourselves in how we how we add to this problem in ways that maybe it's passed down culturally. Maybe it's just because we like to have control. Maybe it's some of that stuff. Maybe who knows? But I think not. There's not a better time to uh, reflect. wanted to make a, uh, a comment uh, regarding um, so 4 verse 6. One of the uh, disgusting claims that um, traditionalists make, they say that without the uh, Hadith, um, basically the Quran does not prohibit the marriage of children. And it's the fact if you need God's book to tell you that, that this is wrong, uh, shows other underlying uh, problems. The funny thing is, Surah 4 verse 6 kind of explains to us what the, uh, the, the age of marriage is. In Arabic, the word for marriage is nikah. And uh, what's interesting is uh, this isn't uncommon where God uses an expression to define an age. So in Surah 5, uh, 4 verse 6, it says, you shall test the orphans when they reach. And this word that uh, Rashad translates as puberty is al nikah. This literally translates to, to the, uh, the age of marriage. This shows that uh, marriage, it has two things. So the first one is that puberty has to be reached. Then we continue. As, fine, as soon as you find them mature enough, give them their properties. Do not consume it extravagantly in a hurry before they grow up. This is informing us that the other requirement is that they, uh, not only do they have to reach uh, mature, uh, sorry, uh, puberty, they have to be mature enough. And then this is the last piece. They have to be able to be the custodians of their own properties. Until that time, an individual is not capable of getting married. It's fascinating that in this one word, this one verse, we have this depth of understanding that's uh, 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 available for us. Um, I just wanted to share that. All right. Um, does anyone have any question or comments? Questions or comments about the verses we read? Um, otherwise, would it be okay to read three, four more verses? Um, I would hold off just because we get into the other uh, uh, topics like the inheritance and the will. That's an entire conversation in itself. Um, I can make another uh, comment regarding just consuming the uh, the 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 orphans' uh, properties that I think. Sure, go ahead, please. So you know, when we think you're like, who does this? Who's these individuals who are consuming the orphans' rightful properties? And um, consider this: God calls each generation inheritors, meaning that whatever generation comes after us, they're going to inherit from whatever we uh, uh, have provided them. One of the things that most societies do is they rob from the future generations. They do this by means of destruction of the environment. They do this by means of imposing uh, uh, debt onto them to the point that today, if a child is born in the United States, they have some $150,000 worth of uh, liabilities that's sitting on their head that they're responsible for. Not only do they come into this world with, you know, nothing, they actually come in with a negative because of the, 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 um, the people of this generation have done we said look we want to consume now we want these good things now we don't want to take the sacrifice we'll dump this on the heads of the future children and this is a totally selfish uh, horrendous thing that we constantly do where you see like you know the governments they pass these uh, stimulus and the question is who's going to pay for these and it's always it's the future generations they're imposing these hardships these penalties on people who have no voice because God, one thing God does in the Quran is he advocates for those who have the, 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 the smallest voice, the, the, the orphan, the poor, the weak, 
uh, the uh, despondent, that's the one that God is constantly saying, hey, we have to regard these people. Irony, though, is who has the lowest voice? Who has no voice whatsoever? It's those of the future generation. They have no one to advocate for them. And that's why it's important when we do these things, you know, we pass these bills, we pass these stimulus, we impose these, uh, 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 this debt. What we're doing is we're robbing the future generation of their uh, uh, God-given inheritance. Well, it kind of goes both ways sometimes. Um, so uh, I had planned to go to college, and then in 1982, we got President Reagan was uh, in office, and he fulfilled his uh, promise to uh, cut some of the benefits of the GI Bill that was promised to people who paid for it with their lives in the war. And one of the uh, one of the promises for deceased uh, war veterans was to pay for the college education of their children. However, uh, because of, um, you know, prudent, um, right? I mean, I mean, here, look, I'm a extreme libertarian myself. However, it's the transition I'm pointing at, but the, the, the restrict or the, the, the cutting the promise or breaking the promise for political means uh, that that meant I didn't have uh, uh, my college anymore. It was pulled out from under my feet at the time. Uh, so that was that's an example of of uh, you know I, I don't like to look at the pol I think politics is is just simply uh, the pursuit of power, popularity, power, po power through popularity. Uh, you know, masked, masked, disguised behind uh altruistic motives and behind uh even masked behind um um uh economic principles it's just the pursuit of power god has all power and yeah, you know i'm god. not mashallah i agree i mean i think uh this isn't something that is unique to to one you know uh, uh a political group or um uh, uh, president or term, you know, these are these are human tendencies that willing to rob from the future generations if it means it's going to uh, give us wealth today. Uh, consider, for instance, like if you had a, a tree that's bearing fruit, you know, that you would deplete all its uh, nutrients if you could, if that meant that in essence there's going to be more for you. Um, and this is just a sad thing that most of us do. You know, there's a, a parable that says, you know, uh, bless the man who plants a tree who knows that he won't be here to enjoy its shade or its fruit. And, you know, submitters, if we're only concerned with kind of uh, enriching ourselves, um, you know, making ourselves uh, wealthier, fatter, uh, um, you know, more resources at the expense of future generations, it shows that we're living for this world as opposed to the hereafter. And, uh, you know, when we, we plant seeds, and this is in, in various forms, um, we shouldn't be looking to, okay, how's this going to benefit me? I mean, obviously, we have to uh, account for whatever share we need to survive. Our bigger uh, concern should be, how is this going to benefit you know, future generations, people that I'm never going uh, to engage with, to talk with, to uh, even see the benefits of this uh, work? When we do that, this is kind of the, the parable, you know, give with your right that your left hand doesn't even know. Um, when you do something that you know, you're like, I have no clue who's going to benefit from this. I have no clue how this is going to impact the lives of others. I could say definitively by doing this work, others are going to benefit. Um, that's when we know we're doing it for the right cause. It's something that it's like, it's, uh, uh, it, we just have to constantly be reminded because it's interesting in the Quran, why does it talk so much about the disbelievers consuming the inheritance of helpless orphans if this is such a niche case? How many people are going to be the custodians of orphans? You know, barely any. It's a, it's a very fringe thing. If we consider that this orphans is a representation of just future generations, individuals who've yet to uh, to have you know parents, let alone advocates, um, then we realize like, okay, anything we do in our actions, we have to be conscientious how this is going to impact future generations.
You know, Marshall, I never thought about it that way, how it's going to affect um, our future generation. I, but I always had that in mind that who's going to be paying for all this? Well, because they keep saying don't have money, but then they come up with all this money. And unfortunately, unfortunately, people who are really rich are the one who gets a lot of money. Our businesses, it helps businesses that they are falling apart and just keep them in business. But on the other hand, all these rich people, they come out with millions of dollars that they collect and, uh, and they benefited to even uh, build more wealth. It's not like saving their wealth. It's uh, actually, you know, but they just know how to get around system. But I think um, if, if that was in mind that make it a little bit harder to uh, give the money to people who really need it, so that, uh, building uh, all the wealthy people, the bankers are the ones that, that uh, really uh, made a lot of money. And now... You know, they are rocky with all people's property I, and, you know, taking all the money. But I think I, you know, I never looked at it that way. And I think this is great. I wish they talked about it before they grant all that money, you know. Well, we are here to talk about it, inshallah. Yeah. I put a inshallah verse, I think it's very to... important. God mm -hmm. bless you. I put a verse, welcome everybody to the submission server in the Quran study. Uh, in the two, three, in three minutes, inshallah, we will have the open discussion format. Right now, we read the verses, chapter three, verse one ninety. We finished that surah, chapter three. We went to chapter four and read the first six verses. And also, um, on this topic of spending in the cause of God, if you think about it like this, spending in the cause of God is the best way you can spend your money. And even then, God says you have to watch out. In chapter 2, verse 195, I loaded the verse here. It says, you shall spend in the cause of God. Do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. You shall be charitable. God loves the charitable. So here we have an example of a verse. I'm sorry, an example of an instance where it's the best possible spending of money. But even here it says you can be excessive. You can do too much. And you can cause your own destruction, financial damage. Um, so we have to be reasonable. We have to be uh, aware of how we are uh, doing uh, these spendings. We cannot just spend uh, in a way that is not um, uh, intelligent. So God supports us. God says do not be excessive. If I could uh, add something to that, you know, it's always interesting. We always compare ourselves up and we compare ourselves uh, against, you know, in essence, people that we think have more than us. You talk to someone who has a million dollars, they're going to be looking at the, the one who has $10 million. You talk to the guy who has $10 million, he's going to look at the guy who has $100 million. You talk to that guy, he's looking at the billionaires, right? The thing is, if you look at it globally, if you're making more than a, it, the number uh, is in flux, but I, I believe it's anywhere between like uh, $30,000 to $60,000 a year technically in the top one percent of the world right? that's something that we have to contemplate if you're living in the united states if you're on discord if you're having these conversations you have a roof over your head you have food in your fridge you're not worried about you know kind of uh, where you're going to get your next meal you're probably one of you know the top 10 percent easily of wealth in the world and this is something that we we forget like we live in these affluent societies and we see these you know Bezos and Elon Musk, and we, we compare ourselves against them, you know, these hedge fund billionaires. But the reality is, even if you take the average person living in America, they're far wealthier, they have far more access, they have far more resources than the majority of the, the population that is really suffering out there. You know, you consider the person who's making one dollar a day. It seems like if we saw two people, one's making a dollar a day, the other one's making two dollars a day, we say they're both poor. To the one who's making one dollar a day, he looks at the guy who's making two dollars a day and says, "This guy's rich." So a lot of this is just relative. Like we shouldn't uh, absolve ourselves of responsibilities because, praise God, we have more today than any generation had in the past. A you know, homeless guy living on the streets on uh, in San Francisco is walking past them. He has a cell phone. He has plenty of food in his uh, belly. He has all the ent entertainment, all the, the the resources that the most powerful kings of the past did not have. Yeah, in certain regards, he's poor, but in certain regards, he's far wealthier than the poor people of the past. I, I, that reminds me of something happened to me. 
so in the 90s, I used to do these self-improvement, self-empowerment uh, uh, seminars. And I was in this one group. And there's a man who, he owned his own island off the sound. He was in my group. Yeah, he, he made three million a year. And he came to this self-improvement seminar because of his depression and his feelings of uh, his feelings of inadequacy because his friends made at least five million a year. <laughs> so it, it you know <laughs> I, I you know it's, it's it's just astonishing because it just shows you how it's it's just a state of mind your relativity it's like it's what appreciation lack of appreciation not looking around seeing what you have um it, it's it's um it's relative it's just what dude said you know well that's the problem in this country is that it's relative poverty i'll tell you that the big poverty we have is lack of uh of um, transportation in this country, it's 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 pretty dismal for for the poor that to get around, and they get trapped in these islands. The they're called like they're called uh, I can't remember food deserts, and they end up just eating at gas stations or something like this. And so, it's a relative thing, and uh, there there's definite suffering. It just doesn't look the same as you you may think of it okay. traditionally. A uh, few verses were shared, and then we can move along, move on. Seventeen twenty six twenty seven. It says, "You shall give the due alms to the relatives, the needy, the poor, and the traveling alien, but do not be excessive, extravagant, extravagant of brethren, of the devils, the, and the devil is unappreciative of his lord." Fourteen seven says, "Your lord has decreed: the more you thank me, the more I give you. But if you turn unappreciative, then my retribution is severe." 18 verse 1. Okay, I don't know about the relationship of that one. But uh, Sister Monica, please come up now and uh, ask your question. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can can hear you just fine. Please. This And she's asking her question. This is the open portion of the Quran study for next hour, inshallah. Go ahead. What's your question today? Okay, so this might be a bit confusing at first, but uh, let's imagine there's two people. There is a model uh, love, a model attraction. So they both love each other. So I'm asking that if they uh, both love each other equally, uh, does that mean they're right for each other and God wanted this to happen? Okay, I didn't catch the part. What's the model attraction? Is that what you said? Yes, yes. Mutual, mutual attraction. Oh, mutual attraction. Sorry, got it. Okay. So if you yeah, I mean that's the requirements of marriage, right? If there's mutual attraction, there's love, and then they can have a dowry and they are physically attracted and they're believers, then yeah, that's that's really great. They should get engaged immediately. Okay, but what if uh, one of them is a believer and one of them is a non believer? Is is that mean this is a test for the believer? I think it means that the believer should give the message to the non-believer, and inshallah, they will uh, believe. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. The that's my thought is uh, we should give the message to everybody, but especially if we are attracted to somebody, it's a perfect opportunity to share the message with them. And God knows if they will be guided, it's up to God. And if they're good for us, they will be guided. And if they're bad for us, they will not be guided. Um, does anyone have any thoughts to share on this? Please share your opinions. Thank you. Brother Erdem, did you want to say something on this topic? Or Brother yeah. Mehmed? Brother Mehmed, yeah. your microphone, hold on. Can you tell Brother Mehmed your microphone is unmuted? If you do not want to speak, can you please mute yourself? Go ahead, Brother Erdem. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting that it's during the engagement that we really get to know the other person. So otherwise, we're just basically friends. Uh, I mean, from my understanding of the Quran, after we analyzed it, 
is basically you're, you're either friends or you get engaged and then you get to know each other. Like, um, so I, I guess the, the whole thing, uh, yeah, you, it needs to be a believer after you've shown the proof. That's true. But I guess, uh, you can sis- proof, yeah. I think sister, one second. I think sister Shahida wants to speak, please. On this, Sister Shahida, can you come up and speak and share your opinion on this? Thank you. Sister Shahida, do you want to speak? Um, assalamu alaikum. Sorry. Uh, I know you guys are already explaining. I uh, just wanted to tell the sister that uh, if the person, um, because we have uh, verses in the Quran that um, believer should uh, not be adorned by the disbelievers beauty and success and money everything right so that proves that even though you love that person so much and the person is not interested in learning your religion and you don't want to give up your religion that's gonna be big trouble um, so before you get really attached i think it's wise to clear up things because you don't want to marry another religion person and not religion if uh, um, Christians true Christians they're open to uh, you know listen to you but if they're, they're like uh, name Christian you know they they're probably living atheist life and they don't even believe their own religion then you can't even give any message because they are blocked so make sure you talk to them about your practice and everything before You'll find someone else, you know. That's what my uh, takes on this one yeah. because you don't want to suffer after. Because it's it's really important for a family to have same understanding to raise a healthy family, you know. Yeah, I agree because we can, uh, you know, marry with the disbelievers. This is what Quran says to us. And uh, plus, I think um, I just want to ask another question uh, with the shame topic. So, for example, I told a disbeliever, uh, disbeliever friend, uh, Rashad and COVID-19, uh, but he disagrees. Can we be still friends with them, or should we, should I uh, just stop being friends? I think we should use, we should treat everyone as a potential believer, unless they are firmly fixed on rejecting God's message, miracle, and messenger. So we should keep an open mind, and inshallah, other people will keep an open, open mind. But we must remember that this is our eternal salvation at stake here. So we marry somebody for the sake of God, and we get closer to God um, through our marriage. This is very important. So it's more important than any other factor. But of course, there needs to be mutual attraction, and there needs to be uh, a compatibility element. Um, does somebody want to share something? Was it Jeff? Go ahead, brother, please. Uh, I forgot. Sorry. No problem. Does somebody else want to share their thoughts on this also? Uh, thank you, everybody. We're chatting. We're following the chat in VC1 dash chat, not VC1 chat. They're two separate chats. So please type your questions, comments, and the conversation in VC1. Uh, dash chat. Does anyone have any questions or comments uh, regarding the issue raised by Sister Monica? You know, I I do think um, it it's a little time on the, but on um, quality of believer. I mean. There's different perspectives of how narrow to uh, make the field. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and here's the thing: most believers in God, they're going to hell anyway. Uh, those are believers, but not real believers. Okay, so then, also, I'm a submitter, but I may not cleanse myself of uh, idol worship. So. Therefore, I, I mean, I'm a submitter. I believe the message and everything, but yet fall. That not, no, that's another version of it. I'm just looking at the continuum and just kind of uh, saying it's worth having a discussion because of the broad uh, 
usage of the word believer in the Bible, I mean, in the Quran. Thank you very much. Um, next person, if you want to share your question or comments, this is the general uh, portion of the Quran studies open discussion. So if you have any questions or comments regarding any topic, in your life or any Quranic issue, uh, you can ask your question now. Please come up and ask your question or type your question in VC1 chat. Yeah, um, peace be upon you. Uh, I just had a quick thing to share. There's, there's I don't know, there's time. Go ahead, please share your thoughts with us, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thinking about the the most important quality, I think I the, even I understand from Quran is idol. It's just do not marry the idolatrous, or do not give your daughters to um, the idol worshippers. And I think um, that concept is important in 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 that respect because we have the hidden have the obvious idols and then you have the hidden ones but i think it's important to distinguish that the most important criteria is that person you 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 getting married or you're getting out to does not insist on having an obvious idol uh that's that's really important because the hidden ones you can never be so sure until you know you, you go uh you get to know that person very well and their habits and how they their li daily lives. So it's important that they don't have an album. Uh, obvious to us, and if someone is insisting on, you know, um, reverencing them in their prayers, reverencing them their, during their, uh, you know, this is a, this is something that it's a hint. An important hint that we should take take into our consideration where where we're making the decision. But they're, if they're willing to, you know, get get rid of those obvious idols, you think that they're open minded or uh, they have the mind to think about um, what worship God alone means, really. And then you have those that actually people that they even they don't practice their heart only uh, commemorates or remembers God. So those are actually a much better position into accepting um, and understanding the practice of submission because they've been doing it in, a, in an effect in a way for many years or in their hearts rejoice in commemorating God or, um, you know, they focus on God a lot. So you understand that this is this is a key characteristic they invite to uh, to heaven, they invite to God, right? So. This is something that um, you should think about it as a general principle that God talks about. That's that's why idolaters or uh, idol worshippers are something that God uh, warns us about. It. So we should be aware that whether those are willing to put aside their obvious idols or not. This is an important. Thank you very much, brother. A question? Does someone want to make another comment? Yeah, uh, I want to say um, salam, peace be upon you all, and um, thank God for being able to join. Um, I plan to be away from the chat so I can follow the discussion, the verbal discussion. And um, Brother Amin, I, it got caught off for me for a moment. Thank you for hearing that. I think you said something about a hint. A hint is something, and if you don't mind repeating that part, um, that uh, it got cut off for me um, for a bit. I don't know how it was for others. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the, hint, the hint was about um, the, you know, the obvious idols, right? So if someone insists on commemorating or mentioning the name of Muhammad in their prayers, uh, despite that, you know, you, we point out, we discuss about it, or, you know, uh, insist on commemorating the messenger, or prophets in their daily activity.
in their in, in their in their way of in their way of belief. That if if they're not willing to change, it it really gives us an in, information that you know this person will probably not worship God alone. On the other, on the flip side, is that you have people that don't do this. They love to commemorate, commemorate God alone. So they're in a much better position and much open to hear the, the practices that we do and why devoting ourselves to God alone is important. So this is this is the hint that I was referring to. Thank you so much, Mashallah. That's a, yeah, that's a that's a good point. So you're saying if they even though they don't practice, but if they like it seems like they know God or they're talking about God, then that's what you mean by commemorating God or yeah, yeah. You know, if if they if they don't insist on, uh, if they don't have if they have a belief of you know God alone in their heart, and you can see it, and you can really reflect on it, and think about it. This is an important criteria that it's a very good quality of a soul that really recognizes that importance that God alone is the most important thing to be, to be mentioned or to be talked about. Even they, they don't practice. Or... If you see this is the right person and got to know each other, then then you marry. And then you complete the dowry and the consummation. And that's the process. And what if the dowry is set at a point where the other does not agree with it? Like, for example, she might say, I don't think this dowry is too low. Yeah, but more. both yeah. parties have to agree on the dowry. It's not one person. If you cannot agree on the dowry, then that may be a sign that that's not the right person to marry. You're already having this, you know, <laughs> you're already having trouble, uh, you know, agreeing with each other. But I wanted to say this is actually a topic that we've been discussing and analyzing and debating for a while now. But during the last week or so, um, we've reached a more conclusive assessment of this. If you guys are interested, we can share our thoughts um, on the marriage process. Just to say this very briefly, for I think everyone can benefit from this because you all may all know someone that can benefit from this knowledge. The way we understood it from the Quran is that there are three stages. The initial stage is just friendship. You get to know somebody on a very superficial level. And then you uh, have displayed interest in each other. And uh, eventually, th that must uh, turn into an engagement. And the purpose of engagement is to get to know the person at a deeper level and really connect with them and get to know them to the point of being comfortable to marry. So during the engagement process, that's when you learn their habits, their values, their core beliefs, the different aspects, their principles, different aspects, aspects about them and your compatibility with them. Once the engagement process, you feel, you both feel out after an adequate number of, amount, I'm sorry, an adequate amount of time, it could take several months or maybe a year or more. Um, at that point, you, um, after, during the engagement process, you have set the dowry and your, your intentions are obviously very clear. And then at that point, you may consummate the marriage and I think this is the best formula for us as it's laid out in the Quran. It's the best formula for success. We must remember that our happiness is dependent on observing God's laws. And if we don't observe God's laws, we will not have a happy life. So, but the, however, the opposite is true. If we do observe God's laws, we are guaranteed, God's laws, we are guaranteed success. So it's really important to follow God's laws and, and uh, the process that he provides us very carefully. And so during the engagement process, what we have seen is that there is no sexual activity or intimacy. And it's after, only after uh, the consummation where um, there is, um, you know, intimacy uh, with the, between the couple. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments about that, but... This is after analyzing the verses more carefully, we reach this process. Yes. So essentially you can hold hands, but you can't uh, touch sexually, like only normal and engagement, of course. And I think it's very important to 
to emphasize what you said, Naveed, in the sense that we need to observe God's laws to be to have a successful relationship, a successful marriage. Actually, it goes back to the verse we read in this Quran study. Remember how in 200, 3 200 it says, O you who believe, you shall be steadfast, you shall persevere, you shall be united. And then it says, You shall observe God that you may succeed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we need to observe the laws if you want to succeed in that. So if we want to have a successful marriage, we need to observe the laws. If we want to have a successful relationship, we need to observe the laws. So people who, people are not, like most people right now in the world, they're not observing these laws and they have very horrible relationships. I think that's a very clear sign as well. That's absolutely right. If you do not observe God's laws, you will suffer the consequences and that's just... This is just how it is. The fire exists. You can use it to your benefit, or if you stick your hand in the fire, you will get burned. Is there anyone that wants to comment or question, or make any comments, or have any additional questions on this topic? Or can, should we move on from the um, topic of marriage and engagement? If I, and if I may ask a question in regards to that, as far as the friendship, um, Shouldn't both people define how long it is? Because for me, I want to have the friendship longer to know someone. Um, is what are your thoughts about that? No. So we learn from the Quran that the whole purpose of engagement is to get to know the person. Friendship is just a very superficial level. So you know that you are attracted to each other, and you know, for example, this person has the possibility of you know accepting the message and becoming submitted this and that, but friendship is not the part it's not the portion of the process that you really get to know the person in terms of uh for the marriage that that is designated with the engagement process and so as soon as the intentions are clear and you see this person as a viable option on both sides there um there need I, you basically have to get engaged because that's when you get to get to you can spend time alone and hold hands and and really get to know that person on a deeper level, and you just really can't do that uh, sufficiently in a friendship. A friendship is very superficial. You know, uh, can you hear me now? God willing. Yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> this culture. The Western culture, it it had. There's a lot of flirting. It's a it's a lifestyle. It's a way of life here. We you, you, we spend. There's so much energy spent on just uh, flirting, innuendos, just kind of uh, dancing around the issue of attraction and all of that stuff. And uh, honestly, I I think that it's <clears throat> goes against the crown in terms of not being straightforward. <clears throat> Excuse me flirting and this kind of stuff it's just it it's uh in a way it's destructive um it leads people on and uh i think that both parties should be very straightforward about it that that that, uh the union of a woman and a man it's a very serious matter and it's flirting actually um is taking it lightly it's uh it's fooling around with those boundaries and and i i don't know it's just, just from my experience of life i just i just think it's better to be straightforward uh, uh, even if a woman came to a man and said listen i i i am looking for my my husband and uh and i am interested in you you know something like that simply because then Dr. Khalifa says you do the writing of the book. That's the that's where they you you get it's an engagement, but it's a, also the contract. You do the writing of the book, and then you can you can be together, and uh, you can get to know each other deeper. And it and it, everything's everything's above board. Everything's straightforward, and it's not hidden. You don't have to worry about those things. But that's a big cultural leap. That's a very difficult. Uh, uh thing to do in this these societies but uh, i i still think regardless i still think it's the best approach is to be very straightforward the man as well you know look at i'm looking for my future wife i mean just think how that's going to scare so many people off but maybe with a believer uh somebody they'll appreciate that alhamdulillah yeah 
Praise God. And I think that's absolutely right. And I agree 100%. Intentions must be made clear, very clear at the beginning. We're not here to waste anyone's time. This is God's system. And this is it. So I don't know, the sister, does that answer your question? Or do you have a follow-up question or comment? I think for, men, for women, it's a little different because, you know, they're not just about the physical attraction. They want to know if their compatibility is, you know, as far as their attitude, if they're compatible before getting to any stage of saying, okay, we have, you know, this gentleman has, you know, whoever comes to you, usually they're, you know, submitters, they have honorable intentions of marrying you. That's why they approach you. But um, to me, I think I have to kind of, um, you know, if the physical attraction is there, I have to know if attitude-wise, if we're, uh, compatible before going through a big commitment of an engagement. No, uh, that's not. I think yeah. you're looking at it in a different way. Maybe this isn't the best way. The whole point of the engagement is to get to know this. You should already know in a surface level that someone is a potential spouse. But to be to because this is why there. This is where we get into you know boyfriend girlfriend and these kinds of things and. The answer is no. That person owes you no commitment and the person and you don't owe them any commitment unless you're engaged. And that's the whole process of engagement is to really get to know. And I really suggest that you watch the sermon of God's messenger of the covenant. He talks about this topic at length and he discusses that the whole purpose of the engagement is to get to know the person at a deeper level. And once you Let's say two people get engaged. And I think to echo what the brother said, engagement in American culture really is meaningless or in Western culture. It's really two people having already decided to be with each other. And they just have this engagement process to figure out their finances or whatever, or figure out their living circumstances. That's not the situation in the Quran. The Quran is very clear. Engagement is to really get to know that person on a deeper level. So there already is the superficial attraction there already is a general attraction to that person and and an overall sense but the whole point of engagement if we want to really learn is to really get to know that person and since there's no intimacy and two people see look it's just not working out you break the engagement and it's finished and actually there's equitable compensation for a uh, wife, uh, a girl, if she has not, if the dowry has not been set, the verse says she shall be paid an ex- equitable compensation. And if the dowry has been set, then her compensation shall be half of the dowry. These are God's laws. We have to take them very seriously. And if we try to create different laws, we will suffer. We will pay the consequences of not observing God's laws as they are intended. I would just like to add uh, to that with what she's saying is that, you know, I can you can think in ways like, for example, uh, the two families meet together, you know, look, we're, we're kind of interested, but we don't even want to go very far and set up circumstances where, you know, maybe friends are hanging out at maybe doing Quran studies, even just let's start there. Quran studies. Uh, you get to kind of see somebody's perspective. Uh, maybe they're not in the community that much. Maybe they're outside it. Then, then maybe it's a, a very um, informal um, uh, social settings with multiple people, where you know uh, you just see how they they uh, they behave or how they react. Maybe uh, a bunch of people are going to a football game or a soccer match, or maybe they're going. Maybe they're just going out to dinner with uh, you know, a bunch of d- different friends and stuff like that. I mean, those are just normal settings, and you're paying attention. You're just kind of paying attention, I, I would say. And maybe that can be done where it's uh, straightforward and outright, where you're saying, look, uh, hey, I'm not interested in, in, in going as far as the commitment of uh, of uh, uh, engagement, but, but gosh, I'd like to at least know who you are, you know, kind of see who you are and and you can kind of see who I am in a setting. Maybe it can be done like that. I think that it's the above board. It's being very straightforward about it and not, not, uh, hiding the intentions about it. Um, Mushala, some good things were said. Um, I wanted to add my thoughts and input as well. Uh, God willing. Um, case it's helpful so um one thing that was brought up earlier is like um you know this kind of like um codependency or this um so i think that's something that 
we want to look out for um, because it's, um, you know, God has given us the hearing, the eyes and the brains, and we want to use it to our benefit, um, responsible for using them. And so, you know, we know from like psychology that like healthy relationships, you want to be interdependent. You don't, um, you don't want it to be like an addiction kind of a situation where, you know, God forbid we're addicted to someone or someone's addicted to us or, um, that, uh, and, and I think this aligns with God's system that, you know, God says to sever your dependence on others. We want to worship God alone and not idolize anyone. Be our, <laughs> our significant other's idol. I mean, we can't control them, but, um, so I think those are things to watch out for that, you know, we of course want like good, healthy, uh, relationships. And so, you know, a, a partnership, um, between submitters and you know of course there's a different aspects of marriage but um interdependency partnership companionship um encouraging supporting each other and all the different things of marriage but so that was one point that um i think it's a good thing to kind of watch out for and also um the quran gives us kind of the boundaries that they need to my understanding is they need to at least um uh be um Submitters, like based on, like it was mentioned, 262, meet the minimum, leaving in God hereafter um, and leading a righteous life and not be idol worshipers based on another verse in Surah 2 um, that, you know, can't marry someone who's an idol worshiper. And then beyond that, I think it's a personal choice. And I think that um, this is this is my understanding that, you know, for me, like it. Um, to me, it's and each person decides for themselves. I think it's a great blessing to be able to share the practices and um, do studies together and be able to strive together in the cause of God. Um, so that's that. And then in terms of the process, so um, 424, um, that's subtitled by Dr. Khalifa, Mutual Attraction and Dowry Required. So it talks about, plus whoever you like among them, we shall pay them the dowry decreed for them. So um, these are requirements from marriage that there is um, the mutual attraction. And, and also, like, um, I think love is based, like, true love is based on really knowing someone. And then based on your knowing them, you come to love them. So um, I think that's a process that, you know, uh, before coming into the marriage, that needs to be there. The dowry needs to be there before the marriage. In terms of the engagement, so there's, um, for instance, Surah 2, uh, verse 237, that talks about, um, actually goes back to 236, Dr. Khalifa's subtitled, Breaking the Engagement, because even though it talks about divorce, divorce has the meaning of like breaking a marriage or actually just like a, a break in something. So here it's referring to breaking the engagement. Um, and so it says that, you know, you can do that before touching them or before setting the dowry um, for them. Um, but then it says, if you've already set the dowry, um, then this is what you need to do. So it seems like um, that's it seems like that's flexible, like when the dowry is set, if it's set. Um, you know, uh, before this is my understanding, if it's set before the engagement or after the engagement. Uh, um, uh, yeah, if did, I can just quickly can you guys hear me? That, yeah, if I could just quickly comment on that. As far as we can tell, the dowry is set during engagement. There's no, it doesn't make sense to set a dowry before you even know someone or are getting to know someone. You can't do that. You can't set a dowry for your friend, right? So uh, the dowry is set for the, during the engagement at some point, and then um, if, if the engagement is broken before the dowry set, then it's an equitable compensation in the verse that you read or you, you referred to. And then if, if the engagement is broken after the dowry set, the compensation is half of the dowry. This is in the two verses that you referred to. Um, and you said very correctly that this superficial love is not appropriate. The true love is really uh, established after a period of time, they get to know each other during the time of engagement. And the messenger of the covenant explains this very well. 
um, in his sermon on marriage uh, and um, and this whole engagement process. And also, it's really important to point out that um, uh, the this is really what it is, you know, in terms of getting to know someone and being in this engagement process, and it could take a, a certain amount of time. And that's what that's for, you know, saying you love someone and this and that, you know, emotions, even before an engagement is just not really helpful to what you need in terms of what you have to do for a marriage. So um, the process is lay, laid out. And it's also important to note that marriage is very serious in the Quran. It's a very serious matter. It should not be taken lightly, especially in light of everything that's going on in the world. And in the West, we have you know, close to 70% divorce rates. This is not a light thing. And God calls it, you know, we know it's a divine institution. It's a solemn pledge. It's a covenant. It's not a light issue. It's a very, very serious um, matter. And so it's true that uh, um, uh, breaking the engagement is also classified as divorce in the Quran. However, it's obviously not the main um, form of divorce. But it should be taken very seriously. And as Brother Jeff said, intentions must be made very clear at the onset. Hey, I'm interested in a serious relationship. I'm looking for marriage. And both sides need to reach that point. Um, just, you know, meaningless flirting and innuendos and this and that um, really are not part of God's system and my understanding. Yeah, we need to realize um, so this is something I didn't understand Peter, previously, right? What is the whole point of engagement? We need to think about this. Because is this just, is this just like a gray area that is supposed to be like an intermediate place, like just empty? No, it has a certain meaning. That's what I, that's what I learned. So the whole point of engagement is the whole difference from friends and difference from actual consummation of marriage. Outside of engagement, before engagement, you are technically friends. So you need to act as friends. Then the moment you, you realize, oh, this person could actually be a potential partner for me. And the other person says, oh, this person can be a potential partner for me as well. They, they confess and they, um, they make an arrangement to get engaged. And then during the engagement, they can spend time and talk uncomfortably. Now... It's romantic. It's not just friends anymore. That's the whole point of engagement. Otherwise, why is it there? The whole point of engagement is that you get to know each other, that you're comfortable, that you're romantic and non-sexual because that is the difference from marriage. So I, I think that's, those are very important to realize. And um, Farid made a good point, but I, I forgot what the point was. I was going to comment on that. but um, If you can just... If yeah. someone can share the link to the sermon by Messenger of Covenant on this topic, I think it's very informative. It took me a few times to watch it and really grasp this concept. But I just encourage everyone to just be patient on this topic. It's a really deep subject, and it just it requires a lot of thought. I would suggest that you reread re re the verses and look at them in light of the, um, the teachings of the Messenger on this topic. It's very powerful. It's very profound, and it just has so much depth to it in terms of the value of this whole process and really for us to appreciate what God is telling us in terms of, you know, this whole marriage process. So we have the initial friendship, we have the engagement period, and then we have the consummation, which uh, basically finalizes the marriage. So this is God's system, and um, we can see it in the Quran, there's many verses. But yeah, if someone can share that sermon, that will be wonderful, inshallah. Mashallah, it's uh, good to be, yeah, it is an important topic and it's a deep topic and, and yeah, it's good to be able to talk about it and mashallah, I agree that, you know, we want to observe God's laws and um, so mashallah, some good things were made to be straightforward, to observe God's laws. I think that, so my understanding is different and I think perhaps there can be like cultural and I've, uh, I think I've heard, you know, I've heard a lot of the Khalifas, um, videos and I think I know what's being talked about like where he talks about the engagement and getting to know each other like deeper it's been a while but you know of course we know our source of guidance and law is the Quran like the 
subtitles, the footnotes. Those are all explanations. They're blessings. Dr. Khalif has opened a lot of stuff up for us. But our, in terms of, you know, our source of like guidance and laws, it's um, the Quran and we, we may each have different preferences. There may be different ways to do it, but of course we don't want to, no, we don't want to like, um, uh, add any like, you know, prohibitions to what's not prohibited. We don't want to, I'm not saying anyone's doing that, but in general, we don't want to kind of, um, add things to things that are not there. So I agree that we do want to maintain our chastity. My understanding is that, um, and there, you know, there may be different ways to do it, but um, engagement already, there is a level of commitment because 236 says um, that you can break the engagement, but if you do, you need to compensate them, whether the dowry has been set or not. Um, and so uh, it is a level of commitment. For me as a woman, I would not want to uh, have a level of commitment unless I'm you know, pretty sure. So one doesn't have to get sexually involved, but there can be dating. Um, and I think, I think, okay, if one wants to start as a friend, that's, those are people's personal preferences. But um, I think that if once, you know, there is a interest in that way, a romantic interest, then um, two people can date, they can spend time together. Of course, one wants to do it in a way that one's comfortable, feels safe. And there can be, you know, there doesn't have to be intimacy, but one can get to know each other, go out, do different things together, either in groups or, and also one-on-one, -on -one. I think both are important. And then when one feels like, yeah, I really think this is, um, I mean, my understanding is you, I, for me personally, I would, and I, I think this aligns with God's laws. I don't think this is going against anything that God is saying. I would want to get engaged when I'm pretty sure this is the person that I would want to marry. And then in the engagement process, then yeah, one continues, of course, even after marriage, you continue to get to know each other. But in the engagement, one can kind of make sure that, you know, at that level, now that there is that commitment, does anything change? Do other things surface that might be um, great, you know, that may cause one to want to reconsider. And um, then one would, once one is, you know, sure as sure as one can be um with this process then one gets married and then consummates the marriage um so and then, like i said there could be different ways to to do it but i think that um for me i mean everybody's path is different some of people may just happen to be friends and then it grows into something else but for me i think it's it's important to have that the intentions be clear and be shared um that you know and then i would call it dating really um if there yeah. is that intention no, thanks so that's the thing like if it grows into something bigger that's that's the point of engagement right it's yeah there's not really dating um in the quran that's really the point is if you are friends and then it does develop feelings for each other then at that point the appropriate move is to get engaged and so if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out and there's no intimacy and that's it. It's just, you just end it. But the whole point of engagement is to get to know the other person at a deeper level. Um, so this concept of, well, I already know everything about them and I'm just going to get engaged to have additional reassurances. It's like, um, from my understanding, that's just not the purpose of engagement. It's not that you're friends and you know a lot about them and you're really certain about them and then you get engaged to have an additional layer of assurance, and then you consummate that. From my understanding, that's just not the way the Quran teaches, and that's just not the way the messenger explained um, this whole process. But again, we can spend more time, we can kind of regroup, do our own research, and then we can talk about this maybe next week or, or during the week. Anyone wants to come and um, discuss during their daily discussions. You know, it Can seems, I, uh, I would say in this culture that, I, I mean, today, now in these days, this day, like uh, the direct messaging, uh, that uh, may fill in some of the gaps here that we're looking for, perhaps. I've just thrown that out there. Yeah, I did. Sister SM has been waiting for a while to share her thoughts, and I don't know if maybe it's good, better if we just move on from this topic, but... Um, I don't know if anyone wants to share anything else on this or 
Yeah, can I, uh, can I ask? Can I go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question actually? Uh, about uh, okay, so Erdem Abi said that we, you know, we can when we get engagement, we can talk with friends uh, comfortably. Uh, but uh, I don't get it. Can we? Can we just like uh, talk with friends comfortably uh, without you know having any uh, flirting or something like that? No, no, you can talk with friends comfortably. I didn't say friends, though. You can talk when you get engaged. You can talk romantically comfortably, not sexually. Oh, romantically. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is the whole understanding that we get from Rashad's video there. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. Can you even, like, you know, talk with someone uh, sexually? Because that kind of seems impossible to me. But, yeah, I get your point. You can just, you know, when you en get engagement, you can just, you know, talk with uh, your, uh, the fines or whatever you call it, very calmly and uh, comfortably, I mean, like, romantically. So, yeah, I get your point. Yeah, as friends, you can just talk as friends comfortably, per perfectly fine. Romantically, you can't do that as friends. That's that's way too blurry. It's way too dangerous. Then we're friends. Then we can talk romantically. Well, I am engaged with someone else. And it's also talking. It doesn't make sense. So we need to respect the system of um, yes, as friends you can talk comfortably, but the engagement is the the way the door open to talk romantically comfortably, non-sexual. The sexual part comes after the engagement is finished and you go into marriage. Did I express myself good, Monica? Or yeah, I think you did a good job, um, Sister SM. Do you want to come up and read us your write out and just share your thoughts you wanted to share regarding your experience? I don't know. Are you available now, Sister SM? Is she on right now? She says she's unable to speak right now. Okay, she's unable to speak. Okay. Peace be upon you, Sister uh, Hifa. Welcome to the submission server. It's good to see you today. Um, uh, Sister Sohela, did you want to say something briefly? Yeah, I want to say something briefly. And that is, I think, um, when a couple kind of get attracted and, and both of them are serious about it and they um, express their feeling that they're serious about relationships and they're not looking just friendship, uh, I think that it started that starts really good because if they want the same thing, they're going to go the next step. And and when you talk about the whole process of engagement, I think both sides stop looking other sides because when it's only friendship, then you might be introduced to different people. You see other people's your eyes still looking, but when when you are focusing one. I think you look at it more seriously and there is a better chance of uh, getting to know each other better and give all your heart. That's and right. then when you become engaged, then, then you take it next level, see if there is any romance. You know, and that's a really good not, point. Then, you know, that, that's yeah. a really good point. That covers one aspect that we did not cover. And that's actually taking the other person off the market. Because as mentioned earlier, there was, there's no commitment to anyone, right? But when, you, when, when you're just friends, then it's like, okay, well, tomorrow you can meet someone else and and you can engage to them there's no commitment so really another aspect of engagement is takes the other person off the market takes both of you off the market because otherwise you can talk to 10 other people simultaneously and it really it doesn't really provide for um any assurances or a facilitated process towards the ultimate goal of you know the marriage um okay uh for the formal Quran study, we just have a minute left, but we're all here to just, you know, we can hang out and share our thoughts and talk. Um, did you want to say something else, Sister Monica? Uh, do you want to uh, speak? If not, I wanted to take a chance and read what the sister wrote, Sister SM. I'm just going to go up, inshallah, and read her comments because she wanted to share with us, and not everyone read the comments put in the chat. Um, she wrote this, and this is her, um, these are her words. So let me just copy them and paste them in here. And these are her words. I'm just reading for her because she's currently not able to speak. She wrote, on a random topic, but I thought I'd share. Totally submitting to Allah and being humble towards him, in my experience, 
led to a chain reaction in personal relationships for the better because everyone in my life is a is an amana from a law relationships are easy to navigate more easygoing and fruitful by the aid of allah every action i take should be pleasing to allah including and especially the ones in my family i think about how allah has commanded us to treat our close relatives show them grace forgiveness and to give uh, charity i've already internalized um, that everything I have belongs to Allah. The money I've earned is because of Allah's blessings, not because of my own deservedness, skill, or intelligence. The clothes and materials, material items I might have are all from Allah. So uh, giving charity and being kind is one of the most sweet sacrifices I could ever make. Oftentimes, our family members are the most difficult relationships to have since humbling myself, all my relationships have improved. I am always in awe of how Allah manifests his signs to those who actually seek his company and love. Allah never leaves us to our own devices, and he's always guiding us to what is right. Alhamdulillah. This was written by Sister SM. She's here on the server. Uh, she is not able to speak, um, but uh, I shared this because not everyone is in the uh, chat. So, a very amazing uh, points, very God-centered, God-prioritized um, approach. I think this is exactly what we should all strive to um, achieve. Does anyone have any questions or comments regarding the write-up by Sister SM? Asha, that was really nice. I appreciate um, her sharing that uh, and your reading it. Um, such a good reminder that you know something i've thought about is like ego is kind of like a veil that um separates us from god from other people uh it, it can prevent us from seeing the truth and what she said really kind of brought that out that um and a great reflection and reminder um to hum you know when we humble to share the experience of like humbling herself and how relationships got better mashallah thank you Thank you for listening. Yeah, yeah, marvelous uh, comment, <clears throat> Sister SM. I, I think it makes me think of that that saying: uh, "Do your part, and then God will do His part." That all we have to do is follow the commandments, follow the the the, the regulations, and He'll make it work. He'll He'll do His part. So we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to do all the, the micromanaging of the outcomes and this stuff. We just, we focus on follow, doing what we're commanded to do. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, I just wanted to share, you know, I've seen that in my life as well, that when I have, you know, worked on my soul by God's grace and, and of course, I still have a lot of work to do, but when I have you know, just working on my soul and seeing my own weaknesses and trying to work on them and trying to do better myself, that other people and situations have just shifted without me, like, you know, saying anything to those people. Um, so it's really amazing um, system and a, a good comment by the brother that spoke as well to, you know, focus on our soul and doing our part. Um, and then God uh, can manifest wonders for us. Thanks. Peace be upon you. Uh, I had also a comment. Basically, uh, we know that uh, God is running everything. So <clears throat> I see a lot of wonderful submitters and young submitters who's their time to get married but they don't find any individual a submitter to get married to. So it's very difficult for them. I'm wondering what kind of a remedy can we, you know, uh, give them that is absolutely Quranic and is virtuous and is nice and, you know, is very good for them. But uh, constantly I see people who are like, I'm a good submitter. I want to get married, but there is no one in our society or communities that actually can work for me. 
martial law in conferences, we had cases that brothers and sisters come from all over the world and a couple sees each other and wants to get married. But besides that, it's very difficult. So I was wondering the wisdom behind how we can find... Can yeah, I want to say one thing. If it's if it's extremely difficult, then I think that may be a sign that we're doing something wrong, right? And I think one 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 way that happens is when you get. Sorry, can you mute yourself? Whoever's unmuted. Uh, I don't know. Please GPS if you can mute yourself. Thanks. Um. So one thing that happens is when we become sectarian or isolated in cults, then. Obviously, cult members, and I'm not accusing anyone here of being a cult, but I'm just saying in general, when you are in a cult, it's very difficult to get married because you have to have someone that's exactly involved in the cult the way you are involved. So that makes it difficult. I think the remedy to this is to be in an open environment, be inviting, and really invite people to submission in an open setting. We have to be universal, and God willing, this server <laughs> serves as a platform. We get... So many young men and women joining here every day and are devoted to God alone and, uh, and interested in studying the Quran. So what better way, you know, if there's other platforms, fantastic. But I think this is a great place to meet people, learn about God, learn about the scripture and really focus in this regard. The way I understand it is really um, if there's no existing submitters for you that you're interested in, you really have to go out and... Um, and learn, uh, you know, meet people and and uh, spread God's message and um, and do that. But one thing we've done here is we just have a constant flow of new people at all times um, that are interested in learning about the Quran. So um, it should be helpful in that. Uh, we have resisted a dating channel, or not dating channel, but like a matchmaking channel. We don't want to have a matchmaking channel. We think that would be abused, but... Believe me, it's been requested of us many times to have a channel for matchmaking. So we don't do that. But in the general setting, um, it's wonderful to get to know each other and learn about God. And you can see who prioritizes their life. And yeah, I think it's a great setting, especially in the open discussion format where we're all just discussing God and growing our souls and learning about um, God's final scripture, the Quran. Praise God. I have an um, idea, just just a thought. Um, I think a lot of people like Christians do it as well. You know, they go to somewhere in Florida, build a church or build, build a, um, a, a house for the poor or something like that. I think uh, I submit uh, if we have something that not necessarily uh, for singles, but everybody to like once a year, let's go and together and do something. That uh, you know uh, strengthens our soul. You know, I, for myself, I you know have a, a meetup group called Sanders for the homeless, and I've um, had the privilege of meeting a lot of people, and uh, married and single. And you know, we, we usually went to the farmers market and ate. You know, after COVID, it's a little harder to have people gather up, but uh, it was a very good opportunity because I saw many people. I uh, had opportunities to uh, give the message. So if it's a venue that you can like put out there, like uh, let's all gather up once someplace and do something special, uh, that would be awesome. And that way, you know, people would come not just for the conference, but um, we can be camping somewhere, you know, and yeah. commemorating God uh, under the stars and uh, doing things like, you know, building a um, house with the homeless even brick by brick together whatever it is that god bless you uh sister hifa had a, asked a question um she says what sex you know are you guys in i guess or we should be, be in and i think the answer is no sex the quran says i read the verse uh, chapter 41 verse 33 it says who can utter better words then one who invites to God, works righteousness, and says, I am one of the submitters. So inshallah, we are among the submitters, and we reject all sectarianism. 6159 says, those who divide themselves into sects do not belong with you. Their judgment rests with God, and he will inform them of everything they had done. So our goal 
Mashallah, congratulations. Welcome to the submission server. It's great to see you, sister. I hope you stick around and everyone else and ask questions and learn about the Quran with us and help us exchange ideas to better, uh, uh, better expand our understanding of God's um, message. Brother War Thunder is here. Um, do you want to uh, expand on this? How would you describe this? Should we engage in any sectarianism? You used to be part of a sect. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can share your experience and what you think mm -hmm. on this. Thank you so much. I feel like, you know, we're not a sect, but we're rather are going back to the roots of what Islam or submission was. Right? We're practicing what Abraham was practicing, we're practicing what Jesus was practicing, we're practicing what Muhammad was practicing. Right? So we're going back to the root of what the true Islam or what the true submission was in the beginning. We don't deal with Sunnis, we don't deal with Shias, you know, all that. Those are sects, those are deviations. We're trying to get back to the root of God alone, basically. Praise God. And um, really, like I said, um, it's so beautiful to see over 20 to 30 communities represented here. Brother Jeff, I wanted you to speak on this in terms of actually having a Juma. If you can share your experience, I know a lot of us know about it, but how has this server helped you in that regard to have a community and be able to connect with other submitters? Please. Yeah, so alhamdulillah, uh, you know, as soon as I uh, let it be known that I was uh, in where I was at in Colorado, um, another person just came on literally that's how, what he wanted to do. He wanted to see if there was somebody who was in Colorado. Actually, found somebody and his wife who are 10 minutes away from me. <laughs> and, and this is after going since uh, 2014 without any submitters around here for, that I knew of, feeling isolated. Uh, and, you know, of course, God is doing everything, but uh, I can't tell you the sense of joy it gives me now just to be able to do Juma. I feel like... Uh, the blessing is that much more magnified, uh, having gone without it for so long. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I just think a lot of people um, really um, underestimate the power of the world we live in. You know, Discord has about 400 million uh, people on it. You can meet any person at any given time, at any random moment people join and are discussing God and it's just so amazing. Um, and you know, one goal of the server is to connect people for the Juma and Quran studies and local communities. And praise God, we've been doing that and connecting submitters all around the world into their own communities. So that's really an important goal and an aspect and a feature of this um, kind of platform. But um, yeah, I really encourage everyone to join the daily discussions. Obviously we have the weekly Quran studies on Sundays, but we have, uh, you know, daily Quranic uh, discussions every day at this point, almost 24 hours a day. And so in VC1 and VC2 and VC3. So it's really amazing. It's so awesome to discuss the Quran at, at any time of your convenience. And it's just a whole new era of religious, you know, religious development. I've learned more about my religion than I have in nine months, than I have in 19 years. And I'm not exaggerating. It's been Tremendous, phenomenal experience. And it's just so amazing to hear so many po points of views and different perspectives and really expanding our knowledge and wisdom. Regarding sex, I wanted to say, so we, we worship God alone. That's the top of the, that's who our brother, we're going to be, we're looking for our brothers and sisters who are worshiping God alone, whether they have the Quran in their hands or or not these are these are the people it's the people who they they come to the conclusion that god is doing everything in their life that god controls everything and that if it's suggested that they shouldn't mention any names beside god in their worship or anything they they like it that they're, they're open to that oh yeah that makes that makes sense you know these these are the people you know there so many people they don't know anything about the message but that's those that doesn't matter. They may be our brothers and sisters out there anyway, within how they see life. And, uh, but of course, 
the more information you have, the the more the, the more you can grow your soul by applying it. So if you have valuable information to apply to your life and it's correct information, it's about this type of information is about growing your soul. It's about your uh, salvation. And so the more uh, current and valuable information you have, the better for you. However, uh, there's so many people that are uh, who uh, want to worship God alone. They've recognized that, no, God is the one who uh, controls every aspect of my life. And so with regard to submitters, we have to be very open uh, about uh, who we call our brothers and sisters. And I, I think that's one of the discussions that happens on this server. And it's regarding, uh, you know, what what is it? Who are our brothers and sisters? And and within the submission submitters, my personal understanding is, look, if if we follow the same worship practices, that's enough. You know, you can't micromanage all of the deal, all of the uh, various subtleties and differences and understandings. It, it, we have to be unified at least on something like that. So uh, uh, that's all I'll say. Mashallah, and even um, uh, I think um, 262 or 569 is subtitled uh, Unity of Submitters. And so even beyond that, it's just um, anyone who meets the minimum of believing in God, living in hereafter, leading a righteous life. That's, um, yeah, 262 is subtitled Unity of All Submitters by Dr. Khalifa. So um People may be following different scriptures um, or not, they may not be practicing um, religion per se, but if they, if they believe in God, they believe in the last day and they're a leading a righteous life, they're a good um, person, um, a moral person, then um, they're submitters and we want to, you know, we want to be unified um, with all Submitters, is my understanding. Thanks. God bless you. That's absolutely right. And the verse was put in um, uh, the chat. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders for anyone that missed it. If you sign up for next week's Quran study, you can tap interested on here. You should see the check mark. I loaded the uh, in VC1 dash chat. You'll get a reminder for that. Also, um, I highly suggest to everyone who has access, the way I do it is I have Discord on my phone and I connect on the VC with that. And then I also have Discord on my laptop so I can follow along on a bigger screen and kind of monitor the activities in the chat that people are commenting and you know moving along with the discussion. So it's really a blessing to have this. Um, today was actually, mashallah, the biggest... Quran study that we've ever had. We still have a record number of people. This is really, truly amazing. It's such a blessing to have so many people from so many places around the world. Um, it's just really, it's just a wonderful experience. And it's just really good. Um, I just want everyone to know a lot of time and effort has gone into this thousands and thousands of hours of effort to collaborate between different communities and individuals. And, um, and so I just want to express my appreciation to everybody. Praise God. I would like to say one more thing about the fact that we're studying women, right? Woman, uh, the, the surah entitled women. And in, and that the fact that there are so many women who are now contributing here. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's great. The women should uh, embrace their leadership role. Uh, it's not shunned here you there's there's no well, there's no the most righteous is the best amongst us that's it and uh i highly encourage we need the input of the women us men need to be, to learn our flaws we we need input from each other it's so valuable alhamdulillah Inshallah. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to clarify from my earlier uh, comment that when I mentioned dating, I didn't mean it in how people may understand dating, like in the Western world. Like I meant it as one is getting to know each other with the intention of um, a serious relationship, uh, a romantic relationship. And of course, as submitters for us, you know, it's, it would be for marriage. 
Um, and, but without the, without the intimacy, you know, still maintaining chastity. So that part would be different from how a lot of people out there, um, may do it. But, um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of clarify that, that, um, because God has not prohibited that as long as one maintains chastity, um, one can, um, uh, go out and with the intention of getting the other person. And, uh, and I think that even here it's, it's true initially if um, one can date multiple people, but then, I, I, you know, kind of the, I think the idea is, and a lot of people, I think, well, I don't know how many people do it, but people do get to the point where after um, getting to know someone, then they say, okay, you know, uh, have a discussion of like wanting to be exclusive with that person. So it's not that one cannot be exclusive before engagement. One can kind of communicate and have these discussions and, um, get to know someone, you know, kind of ex exclusively that person, and then move on to engagement. Um, if one thinks that this is where one wants to go with it, so I just want to clarify. Um, thanks. Thank you so much for your clarification. Uh, during the last week, there was a very short article written in regards to the engagement and marriage. Um, I shared the link to that in VC One Dash Chat. Everyone's welcome to take a look and share their thoughts. Um, and we can kind of talk about that more later as well. Um, Sister Hifa, do you want to come up and just uh, share your thoughts or any questions you have at this point in time? Are you able to speak, Sister? Yeah, so in the Quran, um, kind of going to this aspect, of, in the Quran, the Sunnah we are told to follow is God's Sunnah. There's only God's Sunnah. Um, there is not any other sunnah in the Quran. I can just load some of the verses for this. Um, but basically, the Quran is told to us that it's the Furqan. The Furqan is the book of law. And this is the, our statute book. So the book of statutes, the book of law, and our only source of religious law is the Quran. The only sunnah to follow shall be God's sunnah. And we recognize the, what our religion is all about, the history of our religion, where it came from and the functions of it um, is uh, it's really important um, to uh, understand. Um, so God's sunnah is the only sunnah that matters. Our religion was founded by the prophet Abraham. This is in the Quran. If you can read Arabic, I'll put the verse for you, inshallah. Uh, 2278 talks about how Abraham is the one who named the submitters originally. So... The Prophet Abraham founded the religion of submission and all the rites, rituals, and practices, including the five pillars of the religion. As you may be aware, we have the contact prayer, salat, zakat, obligatory charity, sayam, fasting. Um, uh, well, number one is the shahada, and then number five is the uh, hajj pilgrimage. Prophet Abraham is the one that built the Kaaba and established hajj for us. And so he brought the religion and all the rites, rituals, and practices. Prophet Muhammad brought the scripture, and now we have the proof of our religion. So it's very important that we observe the laws in the Quran. We do not deviate from what God has provided us. And instead of that, we should actually appreciate God's system and his immense mercy. We are so blessed to be in a generation that can actually witness all these facts. And really, we should appreciate what God has provided us in his perfect scripture, uh, the Quran, the final testament. Anyone has anything to add to that? I would greatly appreciate your contribution. Thank you so much. This is for the new sister, uh, Hiva, Hifa, who has just joined the server, and she's asking about um, our belief system. Salam and welcome, uh, Hifa. Um, Mashallah, I wanted to just um, add... Uh, that um, I don't know if um, Brother Navid read 6114, um, but uh, that kind of support in con continuation of what he was saying that um, says, shall I seek other than God as a source of law when he's revealed to you this book fully detailed? Those who receive the scripture recognize that it has been revealed from your Lord truthfully. You shall not harbor any doubt. And then the following verse, the word of your Lord is complete in truth and justice. Nothing shall abrogate his words. He's the hearer, the omniscient. Uh, so this makes it clear that 
you know, this is our source of guidance and religious law. Um, at the same time, we know that um, God sends the messengers uh, and the practices are passed down. So through the messengers. So Abraham kind of was the father of submission. And then um, after that, there were messengers that different messengers went right. to different communities. Right. And so that the practices are passed down. So we want to follow the, the path of the messengers, follow the practices that have been passed down to us. Um, right. Yeah. Thanks. Praise God. I loaded the verses. I put it in the English, Arabic, as well as the transliteration. And the verses are very beautiful. And um, we should say that we, we need to appreciate and respect all prophets and messengers and really value their contributions. Praise God. And so... Um, you know, the Quran teaches us that we don't make any distinction between the messengers. And, um, you know, we just really, um, uh, we, yeah, we're just very appreciative for everything. So, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask your questions or type it there. We also have Ask Questions channel where you can always ask access and ask your questions. Uh, Brother War Thunder, did you have some comments you wanted to share? Sorry. Um, no, I didn't have anything specific to say. I'm wondering, does anyone have any questions we can answer? I'll just say in general that um, we look around the world and there's there's just so much misery in marriages, in, at work. At, in countries and uh we, what we've come to realize is is that it's because there's only two places to be you're either in god's kingdom or you're in satan's kingdom and unfortunately the vast majority of the world the people have what have chosen to be in satan's kingdom whether they're duped to be there or whether they uh, uh, willingly go there. It's just the fact. And uh, we've come to realize that God did give us a way out, a way to escape this. And, and it's through the Quran. And it's through the Quran alone is a, is, is a, a proven document. It's, it's our path to salvation. And by following the prescripts of that book, it's a covenant you make with God that if you 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 follow the commandments He says, then He will protect you. You will be out of Satan's kingdom. You'll be under His protection. He'll be guiding you through all kinds of harsh purification processes, but it's all controlled by God. And in the end, you'll be purified and you'll have a perfectly happy life here outside of what's going on there's nothing we can do though as far as the world we're we're such a small drop in the bucket of all the satanic stuff all of the misery going on everywhere however it's up to each individual to choose god's protection or not and and it's and that's what the quran offers us and that is that is what submission is submission has always been submitting to god according to the scripture that you have well, now we have a proven scripture, proven meaning that there's a mathematical code that was uh, um, discovered in the 1970s, and we have mathematical proof that it is the absolute word of God. And so, therefore, uh, we, have, we have the manual, and God willing, uh, we, we, can, we can escape from, from Satan's domain. Yeah, I actually completely agree with you, Brother Jeff. Um, I want to thank Dev here, X. He joined uh, yesterday. I'm wondering, have you had the chance to look into submission a bit more? And if you can, share us with us uh, with us your initial thoughts on submission. I don't know if he's here. Uh, I guess he's not here. Okay. Let's see who's here. Peace be upon you, Missy. Okay, so you're a Quranist. I'm wondering that uh, have you 
Like, what do you think about submission so far? Hi guys, just funny everyone. I'm sorry, I was eating like really hot chips and my tongue is burning. So I'll talk later, okay? Oh yeah, no problem, sorry. Um, who else is here? Peace for the uh, word thunder. PC fine by the test team. Go ahead, yeah. God bless. Uh, peace, everyone. God, praise God. What a what a great uh, Quran study. What a great chat, you know, to have this platform discussion on this day, to have so many people sign up and and strive, you know, think about it. You know, a lot of things could be, we could be doing, but we, by God's infinite grace, we're chosen to be here participating in this study and this open discussion. Truly a gift from God. Not everybody has that opportunity. Um, and then I, in, in the discussion, uh, what Brother Jeff said, which I really enjoy what he says, um, if you think about the principles of what we practice in you know, submission as a submitter. Brother Taslim, can you come closer to the microphone? Your sound is very difficult to hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm using a speakerphone. Is it better now? Yes, it was very bad quality. It's a little bit better now. Thank you. No, God bless you guys. I was using a speaker. Now I just realized I guess this thing has its own mic. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. So um, th the point was, you know, the how blessed we are and how blessed I am as I'm practicing, you know, submission, the true religion, it's easy. You know, if you guys really reflect on it, and, and as I do, the, the, the worship, the practices, and all the things that I'm doing, it's very easy. It's very soothing. It's not complicated. It's very inviting, right? And it's universal, right? I was talking to others a couple of days ago and last night. It seems like everybody has this exclusivity of their faith. You have to join my club or it. Here in submission, you could be of any denomination, Christian, Jew, Zoroastrian, Hindu, but if you fall into the guideline, guidelines of worshiping God alone, believing in a day that you're going to be held accountable, we didn't come here just to play and have fun, and then be a leader of righteous life, be a person with high moral values, good conducts, a good human being, you're a submitter. You have nothing to worry about, right? That's an invitation to everyone. There's no exclusivity in, in faith and religion. Like, you know, you got to go with this party or that party. And it's easy, right? God does not make religion difficult. God does not bring hardship when it comes to worshiping him. Better yet, when I do it and the submitters do it, alhamdulillah, God gives us that energy that flows through us, that makes us feel so connected, so content, so at peace. That's truly a gift. Right? It doesn't have complications. It doesn't have the, all this, let me look up this tafsir, let me look up that book, this and that. It's very simple. It's a very personal thing. You connect directly with the creator who made you, right? And that's all you need. So praise God for us being submitters. Praise God for those who are in pursuit of submission, worshiping God alone. And, and you will see the blessings all over. I mean, it's not about the material positions. It's about the state of mind and the contentment that God makes you feel. Internally, you feel great. And it's a process, of course. It's a process that you would have to develop. But that's what it becomes. I wanted to share that. God bless you all. That's perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that, Brother Tessim. Um, I invited my Shia brother, Uthman, to come here to speak. Um, we had a debate with him few times in the past. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the traditional Islam versus submission and also the view of Shia Islam and their differences with uh, submission. How are you doing, brother Osman? Doing good? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Doing good, thank God. Alhamdulillah. So um, I wanted to know, uh, is there any specific topic you want to talk about today? Um. Yes, I would like like to talk about the Sahaba and what That's good. your That's good. text is. 
things about them. All right. Um, so, I mean, as far as I know, I'm very new to this religion myself. It's been a little over a month. Um, so our understanding of the Sahaba is that, you know, there were a lot of righteous people among them, right? Many good people. But at the same yes. time, there were some people that were hypocrites, right? And Munafirin, the people mm-hmm. who acted or, or pretended to be righteous, whereas they were not. Um, I think in Surah Toba actually talks about this in really good detail. Yes. So this, I think it was uh, 900. So let's read this together. As for the early vanguards who immigrated to Muhajirin and the supporters who gave them refuge and sar, and those who followed them in righteousness, God is pleased with them, and they are pleased with him. He has prepared for them gardens with flowing streams when they abide forever. This is the greatest triumph. Now, this is interesting because we see that the Sahaba, or the companions of the Prophet, they're really righteous people. Right? God is uh, pleased with them, and you know he's telling them that they're going to go to heaven. Interesting enough, in the verse right after this, God calls out the uh, hypocrites among them. Right? So it says, among the Arabs, among the, around you, there are hypocrites, also among the city dwellers. There are those who are accustomed to hypocrisy. You do not know them, but we know them. We will double the retribution for them. Then they end up committed to a terrible retribution. So our understanding is that, okay, yeah, many of them really righteous, really good people, right? Um, however, there were some hypocrites among them. However, even with those people, they're nowhere near the authority uh, of God or his messenger, right? So that's that's our understanding. What do you think? Uh, I think, like, uh, we have a couple names. Of course, we don't know, know them. Uh, like, uh, all the Sahabas who are uh, hypocrites, we don't mm-hmm. know them, like, all. But you have, like, some names like Omar and mm-hmm. Abu Bakr. And like, if you ask, like, how do we know them? We know them because of the what the prophet said, and then what happened. Mm-hmm. Like uh, at the battle, uh, like the Sahabi Osama bin Zaid, radiyallahu an, the prophet said, whoever flees from the army of Osama is a disbeliever. And we know, like, that Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman ran away from the uh, army and fled. So that that's where how we know that. From the prophet words that Abu Bakr Omar are hypocrite. Yes. So I mean, yeah, if you want to look at it through historical lens to see the events that happened there, you know, were the righteous people or not, um, you're free to do that. Uh, the our issue is that once you take these people as authoritative figures, right? So whatever mm-hmm. they said, right, you take it as a source of love. We reject that, right? Um, so I think that's the main difference that we have a traditional stuff. I think that actually she has um, agree with uh, submitted on the fact that many of the Sahabas, some of them, not all of them, obviously, were hypocrites. So we cannot just uh, listen to them and accept whatever they say. Is that is that uh, she has understanding as well? Yes, like uh, we can't take from their words. We do not say like you cannot talk, uh, take anything from them. But mm-hmm. you have like to look at what they say. If they, if you, if you. Uh, Think about what they say, and they drove you away from Allah or or, or His Messenger. Then it's mm-hmm. fake. You shouldn't take it. If you Absolutely. if it brings closer to Allah and His Messenger, then it's right. You can take it. I get it. That's perfect. Um, that's good. Could I make I a, was... Could I make a comment? Could Go I ahead, brother. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're talking about Sahaba, and basically the only. Uh, the way we know anything about Sahaba is just from history, you know, the elements of history. This guy said this, somebody said, oh yeah, he said this, he did this. And what's our verification for that it's 100% accurate? Well, what we really don't know is that we just have levels of certainty. And so let's take Omar, for example. We have uh, a certain level of certainty that all these... Uh, bits of information we have about Omar are true. We don't know 100% that it's true. So what if some of the sayings, the sayings are politically motivated? What if some of them are religiously motivated from a Shia perspective or a Sunni perspective? What if? We only have a certain level of certainty of the accuracy of them. Nobody agrees that it's 100% accurate. I mean, from a 
from a historical perspective, from a, from from a historian's criteria of how do you determine whether something is true. So just think about it. What if he's a good believer? What if Omar is a good believer? No, no, no. I will continue. I'm almost finished. Oh, yeah. What? No, I'm no. I'm just saying. What if Omar is a good believer and we're casting shade on him? We're put. We're making him out like he's bad. Are you a hundred percent certain this is case? Do you know that you're not going to have to answer to God about putting Omar in bad light when he doesn't deserve it? I don't know personally. I don't know. Maybe Omar's a, a hypocrite. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't. I don't know. But this history, from one side, is that he's a good, a good believer. A history from the other side is he's not. And there's and there's only a certain level of certainty. So I would suggest that we not make conclusions about people that we really don't know. Well, I, I can explain it to you. Like in the Quran, it says some sahabas are good and some sahabas are hypocrites. So the chances of Omar is fifty-fifty. But we as Muslims, we cannot like take it from 50-50 and we go one way. So we go what the Prophet told us from both historical sites as Shia and Sunni. We take what he said and that can lead us like of the flag of Osama. That's, this is clearly, you cannot de deny the flag of Osama. I think Quranists also have something with Osama and their flag, I'm not sure. And we have uh, records that they flew from the army. So, and the prophet said, whoever flees from the army are hypocrites. And about the hadith, what you say, like, how do we know if it's 100% true? Maybe they are believers. We have found many, uh, many letters from Omar to Muawiyah, where Omar itself, he said, like that, I uh, never joined Islam. I just pretended like you. We have found these letters from him. So the narrators have said, Omar said this. And if you look at the narrators, their life, etc., everything, they are uh, sadaqin. They are truthful. Why cannot we trust them? If we cannot trust them, then who should we trust? Brother, we have so little interest here in dis discussing hearsay. All of these things can be subject to... Uh, political motivation. The only document that we have that is 100% proven from God is, is the Quran. We don't hear you uh, consider all of these sayings uh, and, and uh, politically motivated or, or not. We don't consider them as God's truth. So uh, this is not an environment where that... Uh, certainty that you are expressing with regard to hearsay is uh is um considered valid it's not this is an environment where where we try to follow the quran and the quran says to verify uh the information you have and to make proclamations based on uh of certainty about individuals it's uh it's it's problematic um and so i i just that's how that I would just like to share that. That's all. Like if you take it from the Quran, what you say, the Quran says some sahabas are like hypocrites. But like you yourself, you cannot say like, oh, I think maybe they are hypocrites. So if you want to figure out who Allah is talking to, you go or to mm -hmm. the tafsir or you go to the historical acts, what they did, whether it is or it is mm -hmm. not. If the person One, itself agree on it that he is self a hypocrite then why could you agree on it so i feel like brother dj is trying go ahead go ahead harry they wanted to say something go ahead oh okay thank you thanks um thanks brother um so you know one of the verses that came to my mind you know thank god like we all agree on the quran and accept the quran it seems uh to me uh, Surah 4, verse 88, that says, Why should you divide yourself into two groups regarding hypocrites? And in parentheses, Dr. Khalif is put among you. God is the one who condemned them because of their own behavior. Do you want to guide those who are sent astray by God? Whomever God sends astray, you can never find a way to guide them. So this is uh, the context of this um, and, and the subtitle, Dr. Khalif is put, How to Deal with the Hypocrites. The context of this is like, these were people who were among them. And even then, God is saying, don't divide yourselves over them. 
God knows them. You know, there's another verse that says like God knows who they are. Um, and God will call them to account. So like, let alone looking at the past and trying to figure out who was a hypocrite in the past. Um, we know there's another verse that God says, God loves those who purify themselves. We have a very limited time on this earth to purify ourselves, to nourish our souls and be able to get ourselves back into God's kingdom. So um, I just wanted to put the input that, you know, really we want to use our time. I'm not talking about like discussing it. Discussing it is good because we can share, we can, um, God willing, bring out the enlightenment in the Quran and, and help each other in that way. But um, that we want to use our time and um, efforts, our mind space wisely and try to do what, you know, look at ourselves. What weaknesses do we have? Am I doing things that are, am I doing things or saying things? Like, is there hypocrisy within me that I need to purify? What weaknesses do I have? And that's the, um, I think that's kind of the wise approach to, because um, we have a very limited time to purify ourselves. Thanks. Mark. Mashallah, I, I, I think that was very wise. Um, I have an answer to that. Like, yeah, you are right. Like, but you must know, like, the hypocrites, so you, you know who you are following, but you are, like you mm. say, we have to purification ourselves. Yes, we can, you cannot, like, purify yourself if you follow, like, a hypocrite. Because mm. a hypocrite will never, never lead you to God. And we are here to find our way to God. So how can we follow hypocrites? It's not like it's not wajib to, uh, to know who the hypocrites are. But you see, like, Quran, Allah states that some people of the Sahaba are hypocrites. And you, like, if you are a Sunni, then you follow Sahaba. So you go to search up yourself. Maybe you are in the wrong sect or maybe in something wrong what you think. So you can purify yourself. This, I see. If, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Like, or also, like, if you look at Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, how they dealt with the uh, hypocrites, they, they never, like, did anything. They only said they are hypocrites and they follow their own way. So, so you can deal with the hypocrites. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, did, I thought you were, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. I, thanks for explaining that. So I think that, that's why we follow the Quran, which we know now we're so blessed to know that this is a proven word of God. And we follow the path of those that we know are messengers, that the Quran talks about these were prophets, these were messengers, and Dr. Khalifa has come with proof. And so that's the wise approach, because like, like we're discussing, how do we know in the past who was what, you know? Um, so I think that if we, if we follow the Quran, we follow the path of, and we don't, Quran says, don't make distinction, even among the messengers and prophets. So we want to follow the Quran and we want to follow the path that God has pointed out to us, like through them, you know, the practices that have been passed on through them. Then, then we have a sure way. Otherwise, like you're saying, we don't want to follow the path of people who we don't know what they were. I hope that helps. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. I can... uh, this Just real quick, it. sorry, before we continue. So right now we're in a debate, uh, submission versus Sunni. I'm sorry, not Sunni. Submission versus Shia debate. Sisters uh, Hiba, SM, and others, if you want to talk about submission in a general sense, inshallah, I will be in VC2 for anyone else who wants to talk about submission in a general sense. But right now, VC1, there's a debate uh, between mm -hmm. uh, submission and Shia. Thank you so, so much. I pre apologize for interrupting. So, I want, like, like, I, yeah. all right. So, like Sister uh, Harry was saying, we agree with the fact that, um, you know, there are some people, you know, that were hypocrites or not. But the beauty of the idea of Quran alone is that you never need such a thing, right? You don't need to know which Sahaba was a hypocrite or not, okay? Because all you need, the only source of law that we follow, right, is the Quran. So, the input of the Sahaba or whatnot is a, a zero impact whatsoever. Okay, uh, because of that, it's not necessary for for our from our perspective, from the submission perspective, to ever engage in you know finding out. Oh, was this person a hypocrite or not? Okay, 
Um, I understand from the Shia or the Sunni perspective, this would make a, a lot of sense that you have to go through it and find out about these things because you guys deal with hadith and whatnot. But we don't need it, right? And we should stay away from it from the submission perspective because we're talking about things we don't uh, we don't know for sure, right? So I don't want to call someone out a hypocrite uh, if, when I when I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay? Due to those reasons. We try to stay out of it, but I, I completely understand that from your perspective that you want to find out. Okay, this person was a breaker, or that person was a breaker, because it would it would have a very important consequences on your faith, on the hadith, on the jurisprudence, and whatnot. Okay, I understand that, but you know, from our perspective, it makes zero sense whatsoever to ever, um, you know, look into these. Does that make sense, brother Uthman? Oh yeah. I wanted to add something like you say yeah, that hey. it doesn't make sense. Uh, first, when I will uh, will first answer the question of the sister or what she said, like yeah. about uh, messengers, we cannot uh, make a messenger higher than other. And the Quran itself says that some messengers are favored about uh, others. I think literally all sects, uh, of course, uh, the only ones who doesn't agree with is are the Quranists. That uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his blessed family are like the is the best of all humankind. He is like the best creation. Because Allah also says, like, uh, some messengers are above others. And mm-hmm. and I think that's uh, like proof enough. And brother, what sh- now I'm going to answer you about the hadith and what you said only Quran. And the hadith were even used in the time of the Sahaba. Like, uh, after the first, uh, first fitna between Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and Muawiyah, people, uh, when they found the hadith about uh, the killing of Ammar bin Yasser, may Allah be pleased with him, they all stormed to Muawiyah and they said to him, this is what the Prophet said, you are, uh, you are not righteous, you are one of the hypocrites, etc. And he did not have to answer. I think this also... Uh, historical that people literally stormed the house of Muawiyah with the paper of the Prophet. So even in the time for, of the Sahabas, of which God says that they are righteous, they used hadith, they used the words of the Prophet. So you know, mm-hmm. do you have an answer to that? Yeah, I mean, like I said, we, we're, not, we're not interested in what the Sahaba did or what their perspective was. Okay. I understand that for them it was important. They were dealing with, you know, internal conflicts and whatnot. But like I said, the this day and age, to me and you, brother Uthman, to the way we live our lives, right, the way we try to be righteous, it makes zero impact whatsoever as long as you're following the Quran alone. Okay, um, that's what it is. And even regarding the comment as you said, uh, he made the. Uh, he made the uh, Ahlul Bayt above all creations. That would make him, that would make Prophet Muhammad actually above other messengers. But we should never say this because in 2285 it says, The messenger has believed in what was sent down to him from his Lord. And so did the believers. They believe in God, his angels, his scripture, and his messengers. We make no distinction among any of his messengers, they say. Okay? So, me and you, if we are believers, if we believe in God, if we believe in his angels, if we believe in the scripture, and if we believe in the messengers, me and you should not make a distinction. Okay? But for sure, there, there's some different ranks, there are different levels, some are better than others, just like it says in the Quran. However, it's not my place or your place to come here and says that, no, this family or these people or this messenger was above others. You see? Um, I want to know what's your take on this, uh, this specifically. Do you think that, do you still think that the, for example, the Prophet Muhammad is above all other creations or all, are up above all other messengers or no? Uh, yes, I think it is because even one of his names of the Prophet was Khair al Khalq. Khair al Khalq means best of creation. And like, uh, like what you said, like if the Prophet, if the Quran that state is because the Quran says like uh, that some messengers are above others. And like, even if you look at the early Muslims, literally the Sahaba and the family of the Prophet, they have literally recorded that the Prophet said on the day or of Ashura, he, he was going to the Jews, they were fasting. He said, oh Jews, why are you fasting? And he, they said, uh, because Musa was the day that he won and so forth. 
Then the Prophet said, I am greater than Musa. We should fast too. Then Muslims were going to fast on the day of Ashura. So the Prophet himself, literally, I think all sects agree, uh, sects agree mm -hmm. on that, that the Prophet said, I am uh, greater than Musa. So mm -hmm. the Prophet himself said, I am greater than Musa. Mm, yeah, you see, this is when we start entering the Hadith business. Okay, we do check that. And that sounds very really narcissistic in my opinion. Prophet Muhammad would be a very humble person. He would never, ever try to say, I'm above this messenger or that messenger. Right? Um, I mean, I personally see uh, a sense of pride, a sense of arrogance when we, uh, when we, when, when, when we imply that even Prophet Muhammad said so to Okay? I mean, you have to be a very narcissistic person to tell, oh, I'm, I'm above that other messenger. I mean, what does that even mean? What, the, what would that entail? Uh, that would mean this oh. person is not humble. No, it doesn't mean that he wasn't humble. That Of course not. Like, he said it in a much better way, etc. I think that's one of the main problems that why many Muslims don't accept uh, Quranism. It's because they have very low rank for the Prophet. They even don't say, like, in the prayer, they don't even do blessings upon the Prophet and his family. Mm -hmm. Like how all Muslims do, they completely reject that. So, like you in your prayer, you do uh, salam to the angels, but you don't do salam mm -hmm. uh, to the prophet. Yeah, yeah, even in the Quran, uh, brother Q laughs, but a very beautiful verse here it says, it "Say I am not, I'm not different from other messengers. I have no idea what will happen to me. I only follow what was revealed to me. I am no more." And a profound foreigner. Okay, so even this literally came out of his mouth, and God told him to say this. Okay, to say that I'm not different than any other messenger. Now, what you're saying is telling that no, no, no. He actually said that I am above and I'm better than other messengers. I'm the most beloved prophet. That makes zero sense. That goes against the Quran on many levels. Now, that this is the problem. You use like. Uh... What is the, what's his name called? Rashad? Yeah. Or, sorry if I say it wrong. But like his no tafsir, I have read it. I have read some of mm. it. And I think it's literally, he does the mm. tafsir wrong. Like one of the greatest ayah of the Quran where he talks like uh, about the family of the Prophet. How we, how they, how the Allah purified the family of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I go to the tafsir of Rashad, the Rashad, uh, Allah says clearly Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt mm. uh, means people of the house, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he's talking to the Prophet, so his family. And if I look at the tafsir of Rashad, Rashad says, Oh, people who live near the carrots, uh, shrines. So it doesn't mm. make any sense. Do you know? Do you yeah, know what um, I mean? I think, just one second. I think Brother Haru has something to say regarding this topic. Oh, yeah. Haru, can you? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, basically, all this Hadith thing, okay, we all know the Quran is the truth, right? So, uh, in 17105, uh, God, God say, uh, in truth, we send it down, right? So, we all know that Quran is the truth. So, uh, I got this another verse to combine it. Lah. 1032. Ah. Uh, what is there beyond the truth except falsehood? So anything other than the Quran is falsehood lah. That's what God says so himself lah. So uh, we should not take anything other than the Quran lah. Like it's it it doesn't get more clearer than this lah. Mm -hmm. Ten thirty two. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean. Nothing. Yes, I know what it means. You have like like to look at the tafsir of the greatest people who live after the Prophet. Mm -hmm. They have literally narrated that. So like, so Muslims don't go and take the Bible and the Quran, like two holy books. So Allah makes clearly only the Quran is, is enough for the holy books. Mm. So people don't go to uh, Torah of the Jews or uh, Zabur of the of Prophet Dawood. So they don't go to take the book and say, oh, this also hujjan on us. Yeah, I mean, what you're exactly doing is mentioned in this verse. Says they have set up their religious leaders and scholars as lords instead of God. Okay, what I'm saying is that you're putting way too much emphasis on the tafsir of Ibn Abbas and whatnot. 
they're just people. They're just people with some knowledge. That's it. Okay. I would not take their word for the truth. Okay. Now, the best way to understand the Quran is that you read it. You know, you find a translation, you know, that's simple, pretty simple, and you read it and understand. That's it. You don't need tafsir, you don't need no nothing, you don't need hadith for it. Okay? I don't, I don't know what's wrong with Rashad's translation. I, I'm wondering if you can point out one of his mistakes so we can go over it together. Uh, if you, because you said you read it and you found some mistakes. If you have any, any available, any examples, um, we would love to go over it together. Oh yes, I had that question about how uh, Rashad changed the mm-hmm. word of Allah. Yeah. Allah says Ahlul Bayt is this, in English. If you directly translate it, it says the family of the Prophet, like people mm-hmm. of the house. And what did mm-hmm. Rashad? Rashad says people who live near the scared shrine. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, can, can you give us the verse? It? Yeah, we'll go over it. Can you give us the verse? What was it? Oh yeah, uh, thirty-three, and then thirty-three. Yes, it was that. Right, yes. The, you shall settle down in your house and do not mingle with the people excessively like you used to in the old days of ignorance. You shall observe the contact rates a lot and give the obligatory zakat and obey God and his messenger. That which is to remove all unholiness from you, O you who live around the sacred shrine, and to purify you completely. Um, so what Rashad is said is the bait, right? Uh, in here is referring to the sacred mosque instead of the the house of the prophet. Okay, so and I mean Ahl is people. I mean the people up, right? So I feel like if uh, what Rashad has done here that he has translated that word the bait to refer to sacred shrine or the sacred mosque, but rather some people, you know, the traditional understanding was that you no, know, this bait is referring to the house of the prophet himself. Okay. Um, so I feel like that's the only difference we have here um, regarding this verse. Oh, yes. If you look at it Arabic, because, brother, we cannot deny Arabic. Mm. That's the language of the Quran. No, we cannot sure. go to yeah. English. Yeah. In yeah. Arabic, it says it doesn't begin with bait. It doesn't say bait ahlul. It says ahlul bait. If you translate it directly to English, it, say, it says directly, O mm. people of the house. And what we learned from literally any scholar, literally any, even uh, the sect of Ahmadiyya, even their scholar says it was talking about the Prophet house. And if mm-hmm. you ask, like, how do we know that? Because we cannot take, like, scholars about tafsir. What you says, we have to go to the first before it. Before the first, it, we, can, we know that clearly. It was talking about the wives of the Prophet. So it was how talking out about the family of the prophet. Then it ended up with the family of the prophet. So the chapter ended like mm. the first ended. So it began so, with the family of the prophet and it ended mm. with the family of the prophet. Uh, so what I what I have to disagree is that the word bait is not always used to refer to the house of the prophet. Okay, and here in twenty two six we see this. We pointed Abraham to establish the shrine. Okay. And by the way, this shrine, the word uses al-bayt, okay? So we see that even in the Quran, the word bayt is used to refer to the to the shrine of uh, what, what we know as the sacred mosque, you know, the one in Mecca. So I feel like it's, it's completely possible for him to translate it that way. Okay, it might go against the traditional understanding, but it's not necessarily wrong. What do you think about that? Because I'll give you an example here, 22, 6, 26. In which um, we have it, okay, al bait is referring to the shrine, obviously. Abraham did not build the bait, and we know which bait is this. This bait is referring to the sacred mosque. If I may ask, uh, say uh, the yeah. answer. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Like what you say, like bait, uh, if I can, I don't want to be like uh, disrespectful, I will say it in the most respectful manner. So it's, mm-hmm. my apologies if I say something. It's disrespect. Mm. Look, I think Rashad himself changed the word bait and he mm. was going to like change it because if he accepts the, the mm-hmm. words and he cannot make his own stack mm-hmm. because if he accept the accept the, how it's written in the original Quran and mm-hmm. how the translators of all Muslim scholars etc then it would lead him or to Sunnism or to Shiism. I, mm-hmm. I think he wa- he wanted to make our own sect, 
Mm. But it failed. The sect failed. I mm. think personally the Quran is Quran is sect failed. Mm-hmm. So um, I mean, can I oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, sister. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Mashallah. Some um good things were said. I just want to add that, you know, when we look at the verse, because it's important um to really understand the context, to understand the right meaning. So um, this verse uh, is saying, um, you shall observe the contact prayer salat and give the obligatory charity zakat and obey God and his messenger. God wishes to remove all unholiness from you, all you who live around. Al Khalifa has uh, translated the sacred shrine. When we go to Corpus, Corpus Quran, this is something that has, you know, is independent from um, Dr. Khalifa, and it's a different translation. They look at the Arabic, they look at the grammar. Uh, some of you guys are probably familiar with it. So the word, the Arabic is um, al-bayt. And here it's translated, O people of the house. But if we look at, we know from the Quran that submission goes back to Abraham. So it's talking about people who are doing salat, giving zakat. And so the people of the house, this is going to be God's house because this is not, this is not just about Prophet Muhammad and people who call themselves Muslim. This is about all submitters. It's submission goes back to Abraham. So that's another thing that supports that this is not just, you know, the Prophet's house, but it's talking about the practices that go back to Abraham and it's saying, oh, people of the house. It's not just one family. It's, it's saying um, it's broader than that. Um, and uh, then, I, I'm sorry, I, I, my reception may have faded. I couldn't hear, so I hung up. So I missed a few minutes and I rejoined. I think uh, one of the brothers um, read 2 to 85. There's multiple verses that talk about, um, other than that, that talk about not making a distinction, like 384, um, 4152. And um, submission goes back to Abraham. Um, Abraham was a father of submission we know that from the quran and so um god can distinguish between his messengers and he and he does i think you know there's a verse um that i think the brother was uh referring to that um god talks about that god spoke to one um however we do not god tells us not to because our focus should be on the message not the people, because that's what benefits, that's what's going to save our soul, is the message, not the people. I, I can give you a clear answer to that. Like, uh, the, the one thing what you did, you take the Quran, first, you begin with the, in the middle of it, where it's talking about prayer. You have to go to the first before, where it started, it, ta- it was talking about, uh, about, uh, about Aisha. The wife of the prophet. It was literally talking about the wives of the prophet, how they shouldn't go to war. If they go to war, may, they may have fallen to, into disbelief. And if we look at the historical, they literally Aisha was going to war against her caliph, against Imam Ali. And like, if you say like, bait has like many meaning. Like I can give you a ayah in the Quran where Ibrahim himself says something about Ahlul Bayt, like Sarah. The wife of uh, Ibrahim, peace be upon him, came to him. They said, "Oh, Ibrahim, how can I get uh, how can I get pregnant pregnant when I'm so old, etc." Then she said, "Oh, then uh, Ibrahim said, you don't have to be scared. Oh, Sarah, you are from my ahlul bayt." So Ibrahim clearly says, the prophet, peace be upon him, clearly says that his wife is from his. Family, he clearly used the word Ahlul Bayt. That's why, if you want to look at, like, at the Quran, we don't go to English, we go to Arabic in its original form. So, so, so brother, uh, first of all, if like if you can reference the verses, because there isn't, as far as I know, and I've been studying the Quran for years, and I could be wrong though, but as far as I know, there's no verse that says that women cannot go to to war cannot fight so if you're gonna say something that's from the Quran if you can reference the verses then we can all look at that verse and have kind of a common ground um, oh, like yes. to talk about 
And then the, one, one more thing I wanted to say, and that is, yes, words can have different meanings in different contexts. It's really important to look at the context to know the meaning because we know the same word has been used, but in different places, it means different things. And Dr. Khalifa was Arabic speaking. So he's, he, he's the best one to translate because he was Arabic speaking. And then in terms of the Quran and Tafsir, God tells us that he's the teacher of the Quran in Surah 55. I think it's Surah 55 verse 2. God tells us that he's the teacher of the Quran. And yeah, Surah 55, Al-Rahman verse 2. The most, verse 1 is the most gracious. Verse 2 is teacher of the Quran. And then we know from another verse that inshallah I will uh, um, find the verse number that only the sincere can grasp it. So to grasp the Quran, we just need to be sincere. Um, and I'll find that because I know I myself suddenly, <laughs> let's uh, reference the verse. So this is Surah 56, verse 79. Um, Surah 56 is Al Waqi'ah. And verse 79, um, 78 says, actually, 77 says, this is an honorable Quran in a protected book. And then 79, none can grasp it except the sincere. So if we're sincere, God is the teacher of the Quran. God will teach us. We just need to ask him for guidance and then read the Quran. And when it's the right time for us, God will make things clear to us. We don't need to depend on other people or tafsir or um, anything. Oh, yeah. If I can... The surah is uh, 33, the first is uh, 32, it begins there and then it ends in uh, 33, 33. That's about how the wives of the Prophet, one of them, Allah warned us, the Muslims that one of the wives are going to fall into the we cannot take tafsirs because Allah is the teacher of the Quran, that's correct. But why do we take like the tafsirs to the Arabic speaking? But sister, I can give you a lot of people who claim to be messengers and they are all Arabic speaking. Because many tried like like we have like right now he still lives. Uh, on the cover and protected by the United States, Ahmed Al Hassan Al Yamani. If you go to him right now, he will give you a ton of miracles he can do, and he, he will explain it the Quran and he will do like everything to you to believe in him. He can literally perform miracles, uh, like he can uh, make a table mo move by itself or a book. He ca he can move it by itself without anything. Is that? Like oh, also like a miracle how you all are referring to the code 99 or net 90 I don't know, but that guy has also uh, miracles, and he has higher miracle than uh, Rashad. And Rashad, if he was literally uh, a real messenger, etc., then he he will give his message in middle of Arabia. He will give his message middle in the by the Muslims, he would not go to uh, United States and give there his messenger message. Even if it's for his own safety, he would not, not go it because he's a messenger and he's protected by Allah. And what Rashad did, this is literally what I think that's literally wrong and that he fallen into disbelief by doing that, mm -hmm. that he is joining the, the rank of the Prophet to lower himself up. Because if you, if he, he, Convince you guys that uh, messengers are like all the same and we cannot rank them. And he says himself is as a, as a messenger. Then he himself gives the, the same rank as the prophet or prophet Isa, Musa, Dawood. That's, that's the wrong thing, I think, of, his, of him. Can I say something, brother? <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, peace be upon you. Um... Uh, I wanted to add a little different twist to it. The discussion I've been listening, which is really good and educational for the last half hour, I want to bring the focus back 
to the source. In in your salat, my salat, the most important thing we say in our salat, it says, yes. You alone we worship. Yes. You alone we ask for help. In this discussion, that one thing I picked up is how often do we ask God for help? It seems like we have a lot of references to this, to that, to this imam, to that book, to this. We ask and seek so much information, but why not just ask God for anything we want? Why not ask the king who created you and me and all the prophets and all the imams for anything we want? And, and I want to read a verse to you in chapter 2, verse 286, right? Uh, 2, excuse me, 186. And look at what it says in chapter 2, 186. Well, inshallah, when it gets there, I'm sorry. Um, well, it's not coming. It says, okay, it says, When my servants ask you about me, I am always near. I answer their prayers when they pray to me. The people should respond to me and believe in me in order to be guided. So, this to give you a different view of things. As you know in the Quran, shaitan is the most ardent enemy. And that enemy is going to do everything and throw at humanity any kind of information to divert us from asking God directly. Right? For the last 30 minutes, I've been listening from all this information of secondary source or some other source, but not asking directly from the king. Isn't God closer to me and you than anybody else in the world? Isn't he closer to us than our jugular vein? When, when Prophet Muhammad was discovering, he asked God to, dis to be discovered. He asked God for his submission. All the prophets asked him. So it seems to me all this that's coming around is a situation to divert us from asking the most gracious, the most merciful, the most kind, the most gracious, right? God is making the religion easy for me. God is bringing the Quran so that I can connect with him, but the human being is not satisfied, right? What did the messenger of the covenant that I believe in, that you do not believe in, do? He brought my focus back to God. That's why I'm able to talk to you, to you the way I'm talking. You're giving me, and I'm not saying, you know, your belief is your belief. What you're saying is you're giving all these references. But where is the God? This person who I say that he has brought the message is exactly what all the prophets and the messengers did. They brought the focus back to God. The source, the light, our energy, our focus should be on God not on secondary information that cannot be even verified. I'll stop here. I, I can give you the answer. Like when you say like, why can't we ask only Allah for help? And like we do that. We have like a book. Like if you want a special dua, like maybe your heart is doing wrong, something or something like maybe you are, your hands are in pain or something, then you want a specific dua to Allah alone. You want it, right? So we have a book uh, called Dua Kumail. It's of Kumail ibn Ziyad. May Allah be pleased with him. That uh, book is narrated by uh, Imam Ali, peace be upon him. And uh, brother, I literally encourage you to uh, sometimes read the book. It's full of du'as to Allah alone. It literally... Brother, brother God bless in you. In seconds. God bless yes. you. Did, did you... Did, okay, what I said in essence, I said... God, or, or the message that I got, is bringing me to ask God. What you just shared with me is that I'm going to give you a book of dua. I'm going to give you another book of this. I'm saying to me, I don't need the books. I've got one book, the scripture that God has given me. The only revelation. And, and to years. bring that focus to God the King. Why would I need books when I can connect directly with God? Why would I need some other tafsirs? When I can connect personally with God, God wants me to be personal with Him. As God says, Abraham is my beloved friend. All right, I have a question then for you. Yeah? 
if you say like we go only to Allah and we don't going to take other men's source to bring us closer to Allah or something, then I have a question to, for you. If you are sick, then why are you going to the doctor? If you can ask Allah directly and stay like in your home. Because you go to a doctor and then you pray that you are going to be better. First, you go to the doctor. But if uh, from your logic and your ideology, then we must, if you are sick, very sick, then we must stay at home and only pray to Allah and then never do anything. That's like, that's, that's a, how that's I a, see your logic. That's a, that's a great question and you changed it, but I'll, I'll answer you inshallah. There is religious teachings and this other question that you ask, I'll answer inshallah. May God increase my knowledge. You see, whatever I do, I start with the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. The orange, the food that God tells us, don't eat without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's the same principle in my life. I go to doctor in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. It's his mercy. It's his mercy who's brought the doctor, the trees, the orange, the vitamin C, right? The hospital. But am I looking at the hospital as a source of religious guidance? My salvation? Astaghfirullah. Of course not. Little by little, shaitan is out there to deviate the human from the light of God. You see, brother, people are not comfortable when God alone is mentioned. That's the sad part. God made it easy. He says, I give you everything so you can focus on me. Look at Adam and Eve in paradise. They had everything in paradise. But guess what happened? They were not satisfied with everything that God had given them. There was that one idea, element of doubt, Satan put in their head. They gave up all their convenience and security for that one element of doubt stemming from ego. And this oh, is yeah, exactly brother. Sorry to uh, stop you right now. I apologize. Because before you go uh, further, I blame like our father, peace be upon him, Adam. I don't want I don't want you to fall into kufr, because what we uh, learned from Islam about our Prophet and our beloved Father, peace be upon him, that he had two choices by Allah. One choice was that like he can stay in Jannah forever, and like that we his children can like be in Jannah also forever. Like that Earth no is not uh, that we don't go to Earth that we like automatically go to Jannah. That was his choice. Or the second choice was that he will go to earth and that he will there be a caliph. That he will be the imam. Literally, the word imam was used. That Adam will be the imam of the earth, as we know. And our prophet, our beloved father and prophet, peace be upon him, Adam chose to be an imam of this world. That's why all we... It wasn't because of an... Like, people have that uh, fake information from like uh, Judaism and Christianity that Adam made a sin and f had fallen into apples and tree. Of course not. Do we think our beloved father is going to uh, not follow uh, God correctly? No, of course where, not. Where did you get, where'd you get your information, brother? Where are you getting your information from? Are you getting it from the I, Quran? From no, no, my beloved... Just... For my beloved no, prophet, his sayings. No, are you getting the information you just shared with me kindly from the Quran, the source? Is that your answer? What's your What's your answer, if I may ask? That when you said uh, when you said when you said Adam is the Khalifa on Earth, chapter two, Baghara, verse thirty. Is that what you're referring to? No. What I'm what what, are, what verse are you referring to? I'm not for, referring to a verse. I'm referring to a saying of the prophet and i think that every muslim sh uh, should agree on that because brother if i may ask you like in allah it says allah says take everything from allah and his messenger so why can't we take sayings from the prophet if allah says uh, take everything what the allah gives you and his prophet you know there's a verse brother in the quran god says if all the trees were made into pins and all the oceans were made into ink, augmented seven times more, the word of God would not run out. But he chose to put 
all of his divine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word into 6,346 verses. Isn't that enough for us, brother? Think about it. Allah what says, is it, what yes, is but, it the uh, human being wants? That why did he say the messenger? Why didn't he say the prophet? Why do you think that? That doesn't matter. Brother, if you but, think that that first is, re is uh, referring to Rashad, then you are wrong. No, it was no, no, clearly no. referring to our prophet. I agree. No, no, no. So, in different, like, let's say, um, it actually has many instances of messengers going to their people and says that they tell them that, you know, you have to obey me. Okay? So, it's not something only specific to Prophet Muhammad, but also for him, too. Okay, I'm not saying that you should not. But why is it that uses the word messenger? Why doesn't it use obey Muhammad or obey the Nabi? Why does it use the word obey the messenger? Uh, I can answer you to that. Go ahead. You have now fallen literally onto kufr because you are literally uh, questioning Allah. You are saying, why did Allah no, no, say no. that and no, not no, no, that? No, 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 no. I'm asking you, why do you think that is? Because I believe that there's a, there's a reason for usage of this word. Why do you think uh, that? I think uh, I cannot give an answer and I think I should not even ask that question because okay. I am just the creation of God. I should not ask yes. the creator what, yeah. why did he say that mm -hmm. and not that. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what, what my understanding is. Okay? Yeah. When it says obey God and his messenger, this is a conjunction. It means that whatever the messenger will say is according to what God has said. Okay. And what was the messenger's message? The Quran. Okay, so if you obey the Quran, you're obeying both the Quran and his message. Okay, and that's I think a very important distinction using here. It doesn't say obey Muhammad. Okay, it doesn't say obey the Nabi. Right? It specifically uses the word the message. Too, because what was oh, brother! Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you say like it doesn't say obey Muhammad. Okay, in the Quran it says who, uh, who doesn't obey Allah and his messenger, referring to mm -hmm. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as bless his family, mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. enter hellfire. Yeah, so I agree. It does, Which are you does referring to, brother? Which verse are you referring to, brother? Uh, I think 443. I'm not sure. I will look it up. Give me one second. Meanwhile, um, meanwhile, can I say something? Or, brother War Thunder, were you going to say yeah, anyone ahead. interrupt? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, the piece, about, um, the piece about Adam, so Surah 7, um, Brother Tassim, mashallah, by the way, good to hear you and some great reflections. Uh, good to hear you here. Um, what Brother Tassim was talking about, Surah 7, verse 19, um, God tells Adam to dwell. Uh, it says, as for you, Adam, dwell with your wife in paradise and eat therefrom as you please, but do not approach this one tree lest you fall in sin. And then the next verse, the devil whispered to them. And then um, a couple of verses down just to make it, um, to save time and uh, make it shorter, uh, 22, it says, He thus duped them with lies. As soon as they tasted their tree, their bodies became visible to them, and they tried to cover themselves with the leaves of paradise. Um, so whatever you were getting from this other source that goes against this, the Quran says this. So that's why we need to be careful and make sure that we know the Quran and what it says, because this is God's word. Um, that's now proven. As for Dr. Khalifa, this is one of the greatest miracles. We know the Quran has 29 surahs subtitled with initials. Nobody knew what that meant for 1,400 years. By God's grace and leave, he's opened this up. So he comes supported by one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle. And then my third point was, as for the point of the following the messenger, now Quran is our messenger. Surah 65, Talaq, divorce, verses 10 and 11, says God has sent down to you a message, a messenger who recites to God's revelations, clearly to lead those who believe and work righteousness out of the darkness into the light. So now, based on these verses, we don't have a live human messenger. We can't obey someone who is dead. We can follow their path, but we can't obey them. Now the Quran is our messenger. We want to obey the Quran and then the practices that have been passed down to us through the messengers, we want to follow the path of all the messengers. They, they all brought the same message. The true messengers of God brought the same message. 
And as for Dr. Khalifa distinguishing him, himself, in his translation is the verse that, um, that indicates that God distinguishes. So through a 2 verse 253, um, God distinguishes, says, for example, God spoke to one and we raised some of them to higher ranks. So people of different ranks, including prophets and messengers. And Dr. Khalifa's translation acknowledges this, but we are not. There's multiple verses like 2285 that the brother read and other verses where we are not supposed to distinguish between the messengers because if we do, we can, we can idolize and we want to worship God alone. Oh, yeah, I can give an uh, answer to that. Uh, from the first uh, thing, the Quran verse, what you asked, that uh, obey Allah and His Messenger, is 414. And the second uh, thing I want to also to say, uh, I don't want, I want to, uh, I will say it in most respectful way. I don't want any information about what Rashad says, because when we debate, you can show me from the Quran, because I don't follow Rashad, if you understand what I mean. Like, I don't mm -hmm. take about anything from him. So that may be sound disrespectful. And the uh, third thing, what you said, like uh, Allah is uh, Allah's our messenger. That is literally, uh, you literally lower the rank of Allah by many. And how does, because all everything we know, Islam is logical. That's why it's the truth mm -hmm. and everything. How can Allah, this actually the Quran made a uh, mistake because Allah says follow Allah and his messenger. But if we say mm -hmm. like the messenger is, uh, is Allah, so actually Allah said follow Allah and Allah. It no, no, that's not, what I, that's not what I said. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but that's not what I said. I'll let you finish and then I'll clarify. Oh, no, no, you can uh, say it. What so did you I say? Said, Maybe I... I said, I'm sorry, I, I probably spoke fast and I said a lot of things. I didn't want to take um, a lot of time. The, um, I said the Quran is our messenger. Based on Surah 65, verses 10 and 11, the Quran is, is our messenger based on these verses. Um, so, which makes sense. I mean, Quran brings God's message. So that's our messenger now. And so if you look at Surah 65 verses 10 and 11, um, then, uh, then you can see that. And I looked up Surah 4 verse 40 and it doesn't, it talks about, um, that God doesn't inflict injustice. So I don't know. Maybe 14, no, no, not 40. Oh yeah, and uh, it's a four fourteen, not forty. And I uh, wanted to say, uh, uh, like what you said, like Quran is the message. But I have a question for you. So Allah actually said something wrong. So He miss said something because He mm -hmm. says then follow Allah and the Quran. But we as Muslims, we follow the Quran. Then why did Allah say it's like to us uh, follow it because mm -hmm. we follow it? So Allah like literally said something we don't benefit from us. And the second uh, thing what literally referred all Rashad and his followers and like you and even Sunnis, although some Sunnis, uh, you say like all messengers has the same message. And what we know as Muslims the Jews and the Christians had something in common with the Shia Islam. Like uh, Moses, peace be upon him and his blessed family, said, there will be 12 leaders after me. Follow uh, them. If you don't follow them, then you are not on the right path. Jesus also gave 12 leaders after him. But what did, and he also said, if you don't follow them, you will go astray and not the right path and we both know that's why it got wrong with the Jews and the Christians they didn't follow the 12 people that was assigned to them and we know Muslims the only Shia Islam has today 12 leaders after the Prophet and they all were all from his family so my question to you when all Prophet has the same message then why doesn't Quranism has 12 people? Why is it only, is it, is it only Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his blessed family, and Rashad? Mm, yeah, nowhere in the Quran says there's 12 people after um, that we have to well, yeah, so, 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 brother, for the sake of your own soul, I recommend that whatever beliefs you have, like, see if it's actually backed up by the Quran, because everything else 
you know, the authenticity, the, these hadiths were written um, decades um, uh, after the Prophet. And so when anything is verbally passed down, easily can be changed. So any beliefs that you are like hanging your hat on, I would make sure that it's backed up in the Quran. Because some of some of oh, this yeah. stuff, I'm not sure what you know where it's coming from. But in terms of the question about the so um, this was Surah 65, verse 10 and 11, and you can look at it for yourself. So the Surah 65 uh, Al Talaq and verse 10 and 11, um, it says God has sent down to you. This is the the end of 10. It says God has sent down to you a message, and then 11 says. A messenger who recites to you God's revelations, clearly to lead those who believe in work righteousness out of the darkness into the light. So it's the Quran that has the message that's that has God's revelations. And if we follow it, it leads us out of darkness into the light. Oh, yes. I have uh, then a question for you, what you said and an answer. Like, uh, I think literally 99% of the Muslims say it's mutawatir. Mutawatir say, uh, means, if you don't know what it is or something in the chat, I will explain. Mutawatir, um, mutawatir means that if you don't follow it, then you are, of, or you're denying it. I, yes, if you deny it, then you're literally not a Muslim anymore. Then you fall into kufr. Uh, mm. Even uh, the Sunnis have the 12 caliphs. They say it's mutawatir to follow. Uh, Shiites have the mutawatir, also 12. Even the Ahmadis, they have 12 caliphs. It began with, uh, I don't know what uh, their messenger name was, and his 12 children. So if you look, all sects agree on one thing, and that is, that there will be 12 leaders after Prophet Muhammad and you have to follow it. Otherwise, you are not a Muslim. So my question is to you, for honest, then why didn't Rashad or maybe you can send a video or him talking about it? Because all Muslims agree on something that you have to follow 12 leaders after the Prophet. Mm -hmm. And that Versus my 12. question is yeah. to you. So, yeah, so, so um, brother, um, we we want to follow actually the quran itself says to not divide yourselves into sex um let me see if i can find um i think i don't know if you were on earlier one of um the submitters and and we're not we're we're, we're not quran is like the submitters that's 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 different and so what the quran advocates is not to divide not to dispute to follow god's message god's message is simple 262 if you believe in God, believe in the hereafter, lead a righteous life, doesn't matter what you call yourself, it's your beliefs and your righteousness that's going to get you back to God. 262, 569, um, that's simple. Now, if we do these practices, we nourish and purify our souls more. We can go to the high heaven, we can get higher ranks, but multiple verses in the Quran uh, support that. So, um, uh, there, you know, as far as like Dr. Khalifa wanting to create a sect for himself, the his translation advocates not to divide. Um, so I hope that um, that answers. And this is uh, six one fifty nine is one of them. Those who divide themselves into sects do not belong with you. Um, and we know there's multiple verses that. Uh, advocate unity among the submitters like 3200 was one of the uh one of the brothers read earlier um and other verses as well so it's almost uh time for me to do salat here so um i'm gonna um uh,